Hello, hello, welcome, welcome, welcome to the stream. I had a lot of coffee this morning, a lot of coffee. I, I kind of like, I didn't have coffee, I didn't wake up as early as I typically do and have coffee, so then I woke up later, and then it was even later to when I had coffee, so then I drank the same amount of coffee that I usually stretch across like two hours over the span of like 35 minutes, and now we're here. Um, welcome to Art Brunch. Welcome to the Travel Agency. For those of you just tuning in, for those of you who this is your first time seeing a stream uh, over on our channel, I do want to let you know kind of what we do. So our mission here at the Travel Agency is to nurture a digitally native platform that hosts contemporary art making, produces art-centered entertainment, and provides digital residencies with multimedia exhibition opportunities for emerging artists. We present contemporary art in an approachable manner and provide tools and expertise to artists to share their practice in new ways. Our live media programming cultivates unconventional audiences, promotes understanding through interaction, and provides alternative avenues for public interest and support for the arts. Um, thank you all for tuning in today. Uh, I want to introduce our wonderful birthday boy, Jake Leach. Hi. Hey. We... <laughs> You know, about a month ago, we ate we ate uh, pancakes to celebrate your birthday, and and I could almost eat a pancake again. Yeah. Are, are you are you doing pancakes again for your birthday today, or? Uh, no, I I'm still. So again, when we bought, okay, so I went the bachelor route and bought, uh, it boxed pancakes. You guys made fresh ones, which were delicious, but um. I, th I thought there was only like 10 per box, but there was actually 30 per box or like 35. So I bought like three boxes worth. So I still have two boxes oh. <laughs> in my freezer full of just an insane amount of small, you know, what are those, the dime pancakes or, um, or quarters? Anyway. Um, silver I'm, dollars. Silver dollar. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. I'm sure someone in the chat's already roasting me over that. Um, I, uh, yeah, I just, I can't do it. I cannot do it. I have to, I got egos recently though, so I, I've oh. moved to that. I okay. could do egos. I could do waffles. I can't do pancakes. Great. Well, so I, I I have to say that I did get you a birthday gift, but it hasn't arrived yet. So oh my goodness. I I think so sweet. I think on the next art brunch that we do, which which I, I'll I'll reveal it to you on the next art brunch that we do. But we are taking next week off. So, okay. uh. So it'll be in two weeks probably that I, I reveal to you your birthday gift. And it, it may or may not make sense at that point in time. But Hey, I, I honestly love when birthdays extend beyond the confines of the day itself. Yeah. I think those days are actually like like the post-birthday or the pre-birthday lunch or dinner or like coffee or mm. like just hang is like mm -hmm. honestly almost always better than the actual day itself. Well, then um, you'll really like what's going to happen in a couple okay. of weeks. <laughs> I can't wait. I also just want to lo I just want to note that we work on birthdays here at the Art Brunch, but we take the week after off. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's how we roll around here. So. Is that what we did? Yeah, get your money. That's what we're doing right now. Oh, that's what we're doing now. Okay. Yeah. I so didn't know if there was a previous yet. press 2021, you know. Yeah, work yeah. on your birthday. <laughs> Goof through and four in the chat says happy birthday Jake to exclamation oh, thank points. Thank you. We do have a guest today. Yes, we do. <laughs> I say like we we never don't have a guest. <laughs> Whoa, what a concept. I'm going to uh read read Matthew's bio here and we'll get him get him on the screen. So Matthew Sage is an American artist and educator. He works with audio, video, text, and image. His work explores the amorphous spaces between historical artistic publishing models and democratized digital media environments. He ran Patient Sounds, a record label, for 10 years and released more than 140 art objects from artists around the world in that decade. He now runs Cached.media, an intermedia platform producing and distributing intermedia art objects. He lives in Chicago where he teaches and works in his garden. Welcome to the show, Matt. Thank you for having me. Well, let's let's first of all talk about Matthew versus Matt, and and, and just oh make God. sure we're all on the same page here. Well, and then there's an M too. There's just M dot. Yeah. Um, oh, M. Mm. So it all 
there are a million Matt Sages in the world. I don't know if either of you experienced this thing where you have a name that a lot of other people have, but there are a lot of Matt Sages in the world. It's like a very common name. I don't think either of us had uh, that problem. <laughs> yeah. And so uh, when I went to register my ASCAP, which is like how you license music, it has to be a name that no one else has registered before. And both Matthew Sage and Matt Sage had already been registered on ASCAP. And so I'm registered as Matthew J. Sage, which is why a lot of my stuff is like Matthew J. Sage, whatever. J is my middle name. Well, John. But uh, and so <laughs> when it true. comes to like talking, talking to friends or I don't know, like when I introduce myself to my students, I am like Professor Matthew Sage. You can call me Matt. So uh, it's one of those things where the full name is there. But uh, if you're talking to me, I'm Matt. And that's great. And then M. Sage is also a byproduct of that situation. Totally. Uh, there was also like 12 mats in my friend group in high school. And so we all went first name, last name. It was like how the mats were known. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I was Matt Sage, like one word, one name, all the way through high school. Uh, and then when I moved to Chicago, I was like, I'm going to try something different. I'm going to go by Matthew. <laughs> and I uh, didn't love it, I'll be honest. And so, yeah, uh, I've gone back to mainly just being Matt. So call me Matt, you guys. It's great. It's Matt. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, I, I feel a kinship to the first name, last name as one word. Uh, Jake Leach. Jake, whole yep. life. Yep. Totally. Yep. Because there's a zillion Jakes, and I'm used to that. Mm -hmm. um, Rick, how many? I don't feel like I know very many Ricks. No, Rick is kind of uh, – well, so in high school, high school and pre-high school, it was Ricky. If you can imagine, uh, Ricky. If you can imagine, how do you feel about that? <laughs> uh, I mean, I rocked it. I rocked it. Yeah, the whole the whole time. Um, and then uh, the the inertia was just way too strong to make the shift in in kind of like a system of of uh, you, you know consecutive grades in the same school district. Um, so then when I went to art school, I dropped it to just Rick. Um, cause my full name's Richard. So I, I kind of had like, I think Richard is a lot more common and people can run with Richard and make lives off Richard. Richard, you know, has great artist art history merit. There's a lot of Richards that I like. Yeah. Um, but I, I think that like, I like Rick because it's like a working man's name. <laughs> yeah. I like Rick for that reason too. It's a great name. Um, like yeah. it's, it's like the guy that's fixing your car or like working on your shit, you know, like his name is Rick. It's not it's Richard. Like running your internet art brunch. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I am a technician. <laughs> yeah. You're, exactly You're a pilot. But I, so, pilots are named Rick. Yeah. So, so that was the move and it, and it kind of has become a really important part of my personal brand because like there are no, there are no like other Ricks at my age in my age group. Yeah. It's very, it's very rare. So it, it's ended so, up kind of working out for me there. Rare millennial name, I think. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, so I'm taking it and running, running with it. Uh, Caitlin Zira in the chat says, "Happy birthday, Jake!" Oh, thanks, Caitlin. Smooches to all. Thank you. Um, so Is yeah, this a show where I should have the chat open, probably. Yeah, you should have the chat open. I think I should. Have. I think that we should actually move. You know, we should actually move to you having the chat open all the time. I think that's right. Okay, because we usually let Rick kind of handle it because he's you know the the toastmaster. He knows what he's doing, and I kind of sit in the audience with you guys like i'm like you know it's like the foil but, you know literary terms you know but maybe, maybe let's try it we'll i think try things it are live. changing things are changing we'll we've live. we've done far more art brunches together than there were art brunches with me alone now that's true we're far outpacing that, that times so uh, you're part of the culture now jake i know the yeah. culture <laughs> we've reached critical I'm mass intrinsic to the narrative <laughs> of art brunch i'll send you the password to the twitch chat oh perfect there we go um should we get some some bevs going yeah i think we should we should bev it let's bev it up so we've got a little uh little dr zevia this week um a deliciously non-alcoholic beverage it does not contain milk you'll all oh be God. happy oh to know God. You got I was, me good. I was uh really I, that was an emotional roller coaster that you took us on last <laughs> week rick I was watching. I was screaming at my television. Yeah, when I was streaming it yesterday. Stop. Last week. Yeah, yeah no, I, it, it, I tried to ride the fine line between people actually hating me afterwards, but also like having me really touch touch people's hearts. 
uh, grab their hearts a little bit, like reach yeah. my hand in their chest. You you squeezed a little too tight, if I'm being I honest. I think I did. I think I did. <laughs> it's like, bro, this is so bad. This is going to go so poorly. I could have gone way further, though. I could have just started, like, ch- I, I think, like, the, the thing that I didn't do, which was important that I didn't do, is, like, start, like, just chugging the, it. The chug. It was very performative, but in a way that was both entertaining and then also infuriating yeah, when yeah. I found out the, the trick. I was like, like, I felt duped. And I was, like, a little mad, but then I was like... That was smart. He knew what he was getting into. He read the ingredients. <laughs> he knew there was milk in there, and he had someone off camera like switch him out. So smart. Yeah. I, well, I didn't actually. I fooled my own head. girlfriend, which was which was a step in the wrong direction for the joke. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Rick, you got to have at least at least the partner involved. There was no off screen <laughs> producing of that. I I, yeah. I I duped everyone from top to bottom, and yeah, that's I when just... the wall started to close in on me. Full scale dupe. <laughs> You were, duping your, <laughs> you were duping yourself. Um, so, oh but he, here we are with the uh, with the Doctor Zevia, yes. and I like I like Zevia sodas. I do too. I think they're pretty good. It's my I first. Think... Never had one. It's it's been a long time. So this was a staple of the very occasional, like once every two months months, where my dad and brother and I would go to Whole Foods and do the hot bar, mm. and so which was like. It's like, Ugh. okay, guys, like try not to go crazy, but you would always do. You always end up spending like literally eighteen dollars yeah. on just mm-hmm. your food. And yeah. uh, I like mashed but, potatoes. You'd spend thirty dollars on mashed potatoes on accident. And they're like, hella and good. Was, uh, and they're so good. <laughs> Which worth every penny. There's literally zero regrets. But then you pass by the like cold cans of something space. Everyone knows what I'm talking about. Oh yeah. Sometimes you're like you get sick of the Whole Foods branded sodas because they're all sugarless well no there's still sugar i guess but they're like cane sugar or something anyway, yeah yeah this has been a staple before and i i feel like i'm eating like a curried tofu from a hot bar that's mm-hmm. that's what this is gonna give me so um yeah there's oh, something special about whole foods that really gets my gears turning and yeah. even just the the layout of that that like cold can that cold drink section it's just like it's just delicious for reasons good. unknown yeah, I hate, it's so sinister that Amazon owns Whole Foods. It really sucks so much. Yeah, we, we are live, but... well within the Amazon ecosystem at the moment. Oh, that's right. We're on Twitch, for God's yep. sake. I mean, <laughs> yeah. What were you going to say, Matt? Uh, we live equidistant between a regular grocery store, which is a Mariano's, and a Whole Foods. And we are always like, also Lynette's pregnant, so we're like trying to eat healthy. And we end up at Whole Foods enough yep. that I... Uh, Every time I walk in, I cringe, but also just like there's that specific green brown smell of like a Whole Foods and like everything smells organic, but also uh, doctor just enough. And oh, man, it's what surgical. a beautiful, what a beautiful, dreadful place. Whole Foods. <laughs> it's, it's it's perfectly fine. Fine. It's like two swords yeah. clashing. It's mm. perfect. Yeah. yeah. I also love the idea of a green brown smell. That, you know exactly like, what I'm talking about, right? A thousand percent. I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Well, they keep the, just... the warehouse. They they don't they don't get rid of the warehouse scent. Yeah, it is a little. You know? It's that's like part of the brand. Is like you want to feel like you are at a market. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And like yeah. they just truck something in, but then also it smells like patchouli and daffodils. <laughs> I okay. I realize I'm now able to look at the chat, so this is fun. But I'm also able to see the the marker of how many people are watching, which is not uh, what we should be looking at. You can turn at. that off. But, but as I looked, as I said, green brown smell with some force, we we lost like two people. So. Yeah, that's not right. <laughs> so maybe we should move on. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Turn turn that number off if you can. Yeah, I'm I'm not looking at that anymore. Um, that away. Yeah. Uh, oh, that'll. We... That'll get Go you. Ahead. That'll get you in the heart. You know, <laughs> if you if you, I, it took me a while to turn off that viewer count Why number. Don't you watch? <laughs> there was there was tens of hours of me streaming to literally zero people. Yeah, that and, hurts. And then you get one person in, and and then you you know you kick it up a notch, and then it go, drops right back down to zero, and you you have to wonder what's wrong with you. What's like, yeah. well, it's, uh, it's just real life but, information. But it's not even time. real. Like that counter doesn't even isn't even accurate. So That's especially for small channels, it's not even accurate. And nor does it like realistically mean anything. Um, yeah. But boy, does it feel like it means something. Yeah. yeah. So guys, everyone out there, people like your patronage means everything. Go ahead and send twitch.tv slash the travel agency to all of your friends. 
let's blow this mofo up today. It's gonna be a it's fun my talk. Birthday. Yeah, it's, it's gonna, my birthday. It's gonna be a great. It's my birthday. It's gonna be a great show. Yeah, Already, it's gonna probably happen a few times. Um, should we get Virgil in the chat? Let's get popping. You're never going to get a clean take of that. I'm always going to laugh. Like, you're going to hear my audio laughing over it every single time, which I should probably hold to myself. But yeah, it just, it gets me. The sweet boy. The sweet cat. Okay. Well, should we get a group pop? I think so. All right. Here we go. Count of three. One, three. two, three. Ah, that That's was good. Nice. Group pop. That's excellent. They are they are extra poppy. I did have a I had a ginger ale last night because I was going to Whole Foods anyways, and uh, I it's got really floral. It smells really floral. Okay, so Dr Pepper is a cherry flavored soda. That's debatable. I I heard caramel, like I, a caramel base. The story that I've heard about Dr Pepper is that they wanted it to taste. Like how I think I heard this on that John Green podcast, the Anthropocene Review, oh, yeah. where he talks about Diet Dr Pepper, and it's supposed to be this the flavor of all of the flavoring syrups mixed together. Oh, oh. so it's supposed to taste like a kid at CC's Pizza? Exactly. Oh, yeah. Yep. Which what did you used to call those? Suicide. That's exactly what I called it too. I was like, that sounds yes. a little. <laughs> yep. So to suicide. Which I don't like. How did that even uh, come about? Because there's I definitely no one out in public that calls them that. But that's like everyone knew that that's what those were called. One of those like strange childhood things where everyone knows that rhyme that like no one knows where it came from, and everyone called it a soda suicide. Yeah, soda suicide. That's what I called suicide. it. T Green yep. Girl says twenty three flavors, ah. which is important. Yeah, and I can taste every single one. Well. <laughs> should we talk about how this does or doesn't compare to a Dr. Pepper or a Diet Dr. Pepper? I think I think yeah, we should get into it. Studio It'll Space, what's up? Studio Space is all dressed. Studio Space is from Canada, and I think that that's a reference to the all dressed Canada. All dressed up in Zesty Morden. What? What was that? What was that bar? It's from, uh, it's from uh, Trailer Park Boys, I think. There's an episode oh, okay. called all, all Dressed Up in Zesty Morden, which are two... Uh, Flavors of chips they sell in Canada. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So Studio Space is revealing revealing the the chip, the all dressed chip. So so I think that the 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 thing is that Dr. Zevia is the all dressed of sodas, yeah. or maybe you'd say all dressed is the Dr. Pepper of chips. Sure. Wow. Okay. I, 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 that's what I think that Studio Space is saying, but I could be wrong. Well, I do want to say that I recently heard. In the Twitterverse, I think I read more accurately that that basically Dr Pepper tastes like barbecue soda. Yes, and I was like, <laughs> "What? <laughs> yes. Damn it! If that's not completely correct, it's super accurate, it makes me mad." But I love it. Yep. But it's definitely definitely barbecue sauce for Barbecue's, sure. Yeah, barbecue soda. Um, but, really quick, I will say just a brief can copy check. Yeah, yeah. Um, check it very out. Very limited. This soda is vegan, which. Thank God. I most sodas are vegan, but okay. Uh, You'd be it surprised. It is free too, certified. Um, there's nothing really here other than just like zero calorie, contains caffeine, blah, 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 blah. But at the very top of the nutrition facts area, it just yeah. says, live your best. Oh, nice. <laughs> what more do you need? I also I noticed that, that, and it made me feel really good. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and this is also one of those alt sodas that has where there's no color. So it's like still like, oh, it's a clear it's beverage, clear. So, mm -hmm. which I kind of don't like, but I also am like, it's good that this is happening. I mean, they have to, they can't, they can't like run with the live your best brand and drop food coloring in there. That's yeah. impossible. That would be, yeah, antithetical for sure. If, the, if you were to like blind taste this, would you say that it tastes clear? I, I mean, I, I feel like I knew that it was going to be clear, but like, I've had clear colas before, yeah. and they all kind of consistently have a flavor like that. There's a sure. clear flavor to it. Yeah. yeah. It tastes it's like good. a clear taste. There's I know we'll get to mouthfeel. <laughs> yeah. Brown yeah. smells, clear taste. Clear taste. It's a show about synesthesia. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> You're talking to a musician, and like every musician wants to talk about how cool it is that they have synesthesia, and yeah. so uh, here we are. <laughs> 
we'll just crack it open, which we <laughs> certainly did already. We we are adjusting the canned crucible post today, and it might it might be good to go into a synesthesia route. Like instead of rating r- rating emotion on a scale of one to a thousand, like actually just talk about the emotion that it's making you feel. Yeah. Drink to the drink to emotion barrier. But so you're talking about like quantified research versus qualified research. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, um, <laughs> let's let's get into these let's get into let's these uh, uh, these metrics here. The first one is flavor. I think that we've talked about it. You know, we 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 run a pretty accurate scale here. Uh, we like to we like high fidelity. Um, so we rate these beverages on a scale of We're one to one thousand. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Take the lo-fi to your own podcast, Jake. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm so, actually a big proponent of mid-fi, but that's we'll, we can talk about that later. I'm sure we will. I'm sure we will. <laughs> um, so, Matt, on a scale of 1 to 1,000, where would you place your rating for, for flavor? I'd say, like, it's like uh, 750. 750, okay. It's, like, strong, but it's, like, a little astringent, I think. And I think that might be from the Stevia. And uh, I almost would prefer the, like back of the throat burn of aspartame mm-hmm. in this to the astringent stevia thing. It does have a nice taste to it, uh, but it's not, there's something unspoken about the sacredness of a diet Dr. Pepper. Mm-hmm. And so this doesn't quite hit that, but uh, I do enjoy it. Yeah. It's a little astringent though. It also smells really floral, which I wasn't anticipating. Mm-hmm. It smells kind of like flowery in a way that I wouldn't really have thought. Mm-hmm. Like I never thought diet Dr. Pepper smelled flowery, but this does. Yeah. Jake, um, you're you're a Dr. Pepper connoisseur. I am. Dr. Pepper is an absolute staple of my home growing up. My mom is a major Dr. Pepper fan. And um, I want to go on record for my own and say that diet anything soda is always subpar and diet soda is terrible. And I don't understand people who <laughs> like it. It tastes terrible. It tastes so bad. That aspartame in the back of your throat, that bite is garbage. And I love it. I love I just, it. <laughs> I just want to say, if you're going to drink soda, just drink the MF soda. You don't have to get diet. This is a hot See, take. it's kind of comp- – okay, this, this is – a uh, fucking hot take, bro. I'm mostly – let me just preface this bit by saying I'm mostly joking. But, like, Jake, that's a little ableist of you because I'm diabetic. <laughs> and I can't drink regular wow. soda without, like – without suffering serious blood sugar spikes and so i lived on diet soda as a kid and regular soda to me tastes disgusting because it is so sugary yeah okay yeah that is legit and I. Also- but also i'm like 90 percent kidding because <laughs> because i also know i also know for a fact if i grew up drinking regular ass diet soda or regular ass soda yeah. that i think diet soda would probably taste disgusting too but i like love that aspartame bite at the back of my throat interesting yeah, I I will just say briefly. I did not ever think about that, and that's good to think about. Yeah. Second, I that's also something I I don't like is that I love the sugar <laughs> of it. Like mm. I also never get like light anything. Like if you get like dressings from the store, like for salads or something, like yeah. why would you ever get light anything? Yeah, no. Like like if it has to be made light anyway, that's probably not good for you because yeah. whatever the normal yeah. thing is, but the, like still the fats with the oils and the yeah yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm so I'm all about full fat, full flavor. Yeah, but yeah. The, one of the compromises that I've made in my life is that I have opted away from sugary soda, uh, so that I have room in my life for full fat mayonnaise. You know? Oh, yeah. Helmets? Are you a Hellman's man? Oh yeah. Uh huh. Oh, let's yeah. go. That's I mean, one. like really. I also don't get mayonnaise brand alliance, but that's like a whole other pod or like a whole other sure. Twitch stream. We'll have the mayonnaise crucible someday. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> put a pass on we'll that. Just try mayonnaise. Um, okay, but getting to my number, um, even though this has a diety kind of vibe and taste to it a little bit, um, I'm enjoying it. I enjoy the floral. I'm gonna go seven twenty five. Okay, I think it's a fair rating. Uh, a couple things that I need to address. Um, being a vegan, the thing I miss most in the world is mayonnaise. Uh, I, I and I, I think that sounds disgusting. You know, honestly, um, mayonnaise is great. Mayonnaise, mayonnaise is, is is so good. I miss sandwich it. lubricant. It's so freaking the good. the craziest vegan thing that I do. This is this is me explaining like how somebody falls from grace 
And uh, there's this sandwich that I make with these, like, soy cold cuts that I get rarely. I try to stay away from them. But then instead of mayonnaise, I use hummus and, yes. like, pickles Ooh. pickles and pickle juice as, like, a yep. mayonnaise surrogate. I'm mm. glad you guys are agreeing with me because, oh, for me, it feels like, oh, you miss mayonnaise? Just use hummus is, like, like one of ten, like, vegan hacks on some, like, <laughs> shitty – advertised filled recipe website but like no. it's 100 percent true like hummus is a great. condiment hummus is a really good condiment absolutely trader joe's has this dill pickle hummus that i'm absolutely obsessed with it's mm -hmm. so good yeah well i worked at it <laughs> oh go ahead Jake. Layers. well just like i think like you cut out the pickle and then you got the dill you're cutting out mm -hmm. the mayonnaise and now it's vegan and then the chickpea is extra protein yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah I, I, go ahead. I eat three servings of beans a day yeah yeah, I, I worked at a vegan restaurant. And we made our own mayonnaise with uh, tofu oh, and yeah. mm -hmm. some other stuff. But then it that's like you have tofu. To have, yep. Yeah, you have to use like a food processor and it's a whole thing. I make but, that for my tempeh salad sandwiches. But moving yeah. on, <laughs> Harp Wolf in the chat says, I love mayonnaise. I, yeah. Oh, Harp Wolf, thanks for joining us. Does anybody know any like uh, diehard anti-mayonnaise people? I do, yeah. Honestly, yeah. yeah. I yeah. and you know what? I think that that person, the people that are anti mayonnaise, are um, very um, bigoted, frankly, um, because mayonnaise is a staple of a zillion different cultures, mm -hmm. um, including South American and other spaces where, like, it's mayonnaise and ketchup. Period. Like mustard yep, yep. isn't involved, which oh. like we can get into that. Okay, Ooh, but anyway, I love mustard. I love mustard. Yeah. yeah. I just I had this friend in high school. Who lived? Who was from? I think it was. I think. Anyway, we bonded over. We like drunkenly went and got uh, Burger King fries. And when we were, we asked, they're like, "What sauces do you want?" And we were like, "Can we have mayonnaise?" Yeah. Mm -hmm. And everyone was just like, "Why? Yeah. What is wrong with you?" I'm like, "Fries and mayonnaise. It's, it's so good. good. It's so good. It's so good. Yeah, yeah. It's I so will stand good. by that forever." Yeah. And so we just bonded, and everyone else was, you know, boring and everything. So. Harpo anyway, says, Harpo <laughs> says veganese, veganese is pretty good. It is pretty good. I, I yeah, think it's something, is. it's like, it's easy. I mean, it's like, it's like a better life or what is that? Butter. We have the butter. It's like good life or better. Good life. Know. Yeah. Or whatever. Earth, the, earth, balance? Earth, balance. earth balance. Yeah. 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 I don't know. They, they all, earth all the brands sound the same. incredible. <laughs> it's, yeah. I mean, it's, it's just great. <laughs> That's the green brown smell. It's actually just oh, <laughs> that's how they wax the floors at night at Whole Foods. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> All right, All right. Oh for God. flavor for me, you know, I think we started on a cherry cola. I was asking about cherry cola because I think people refer to like when when you look up Dr Pepper in certain like soda databases, it comes up as like a cherry cola or like a cherry soda. And I think that yeah. this Dr. Zevia is much more cherry than I would expect out of a Dr. Pepper. Um, I think it. I could see that. I could see that. It tastes kind of like a. It's like a nice like fruit cocktail kind of vibe. Um, it mixed ah. with some, mixed with some like herbaceous elements, some florals and some herbs that I think yeah. that you're detecting, Matt. I'm a yeah. big fan of it. I would drink it. I would drink it every day. I I don't, but I would. It just doesn't feel good to drink something like that every day for me. I'm not sure why. Um, 8.45 for me. Wow. Ooh. I think it's really okay. good. Yeah. Um, if I, I don't know. Do you guys have like really strong salient points about the mouthfeel that you want to go into? I just think it's astringent. That's my main thing. Yeah. It feels astringent. like... Uh, that nails it. Yeah. It's astringent in a way that I don't necessarily love from a soda. Mm. Same. Yeah, I think we can just kind of leave it there. We don't actually ever do anything with these number ratings, <laughs> you know, which is really funny. Like, Maybe we should double down on this data we have <laughs> since we're taking it pretty diligently so far. Just there's never been any crunching of these numbers or any 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 ranking system. Um, yeah. So as a, as a means of like dismantling this system further, I think that we don't even give a mouthfeel rating. I I, I do yeah. like the astring. I, I personally like astringency. But I also think it's like planned obsolescence in drinks, like because it makes you kind of thirsty again. And yeah, absolutely. And it keeps you it keeps you drinking. This is like not a hydrating beverage. No. no. You I, know, I kind of like. I don't drink. I used to drink alcohol, and I don't anymore because it makes me feel awful. But this one of my favorite uh, kinds of alcohol was Fernet Branca, and this sort of mm -hmm. has the same aftertaste as Fernet Branca to me. 
it's like uh percent does yeah it's like a little bit atticky and i think that's part of that astringency but i think that's like the that's also part of the mouthfeel for me which is also like you want more of it you drink it for a night it's like mm, that was strong i want to take another sip because my yeah yep mm -hmm. wow yeah. wow Every time I pass for net in the store, I'm like, damn, it's $30, but I want it uh, next time. I've done that like 20 times. Yeah. And I'm like, I just freaking just buy just the get a bottle of Fernet. Yeah. Just, <laughs> just have it on you're not, It's not going to go bad. <laughs> yeah. Fernet, and you're not so going to like <clears throat> chug it. No. Yeah. That's not like it's the bottle be... you break out at, at the party. Yeah. It's like, have you guys had this? Everyone needs to try it. And then everyone's like, yeah, uh -huh. I'm good on that. How but do you I'm serve going... it to people the first time? I honestly have experienced it so few times, but the amount of time, but each time was an impassioned, beautiful time. The first time I ever had it, we were all just taking hits mm -hmm. from, from the from the bottle itself. Wow! So just straight shots. They were cold. That was a cold bottle. Okay. Um, so I think I would want to mix it up and maybe try like just Fernet on ice, or maybe like maybe tonic, a Fernet and tonic. With I like Fernet and just Fernet and seltzer, like. Pure yeah. LaCroix and Fernet is really good with ice. You can even like put a sprig of rosemary in there. Mm. We're spraying it. You got to spray yeah, it. You sprig it. Yeah. Yeah. I was introduced to Fernet in service industry as a, as a part of the the shot we referred to as a Ferrari. Fernet and Campari. Yep. Ooh. Classic shot. Um, Ferrari water. <laughs> love. I love Ferraris uh, themselves. They didn't, they didn't do too hot in F1 last season. And they, you know, they kind of earned that spot. Um, Charles Leclerc is one of my favorite F1 drivers. So, you know, I have a kinship with Ferrari, but, uh, but yeah, so the thing about taking Ferraris is I, 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 I was told afterwards that you don't like the first six of them. I hated them because mm. t I would always go to pick, like Tiffany was working at the restaurant before I was. And at the end of the night, they would always take shots of, like do Ferrari shots and I would always get roped Fernet. into it, and I hate it. For Fernet and Campari. Oof. Oh, and, that sounds pretty strong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, That's a lot of fun. flavors going on. <laughs> and you realize over time that, like, I, so my perspective on it was that these people are just, like, broken, and they're hurt. <laughs> <laughs> and and after, a, after a shift that tastes, like, tastes Ooh, is a out. bar that's, you know, RIP taste, but... Um, was a bar that was open super late, and after a shift at Taste, you know, you just want to feel something. And yeah. uh, it took me a while to get into them, and then when I started working at the restaurant, then I was the one ordering the rounds of Ferraris for people. You had been broken. Um, I had been broken. broken. Yeah, it was the yeah. end of it. <clears throat> yeah. I mean, that's the restaurant industry, though. So yeah, they're good though. I, I'll, yeah, I'll order great. you guys one one okay. of these days. Aww. Cool. Thanks, Ray. Um, <laughs> So then the last question that we have here, the last the last metric we're we're talking about is emotion. Mm -hmm. And and then maybe we, we do our synesthetic exercise here and if uh if if we want to talk about like what emotion this Zevia embodies as as our final rating and, and as the end as of we know it as the Cant Crucible. Who goes first? Should I go first? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's always on you. Okay, I um, I have an older brother, and he is a serious Dr. Pepper drinker, and I cannot divorce my brother Todd from the flavor of Dr. Pepper. Mm. And so uh, anytime that I taste any sort of Dr. Peppery thing, whether it's this or off-brand or whatever, I always think about him driving me around and he's like 11, he's 11 years older than me. So he was like a bit older. So he was driving me around in his like Ford Bronco in the nineties, like listening car. to nine inch nails on his like Hell CD yeah. player. And uh, he had given me a Dr. Pepper. This was before I was diabetic that we were like splitting a, a like a small bottle of Dr. Pepper, you know, a tw 20 ounce bottle or whatever. And I spilled the Dr. Pepper on his CD book. And I remember being, and like the CD was a relatively new technology. So we were like, I ruined all the CDs, not realizing that you could just like dunk them in water and let them dry and they'd be fine. <laughs> yeah. But he had a copy of a Pearl Jam album. And I remember like being, and he loved this album. And I was like, so devastated. 
And so I go through this sort of like psychodrama anytime that I taste the Diet Dr. Pepper or Dr. Pepper product <laughs> as I think about ruining Todd's CDs, but then also knowing that the CDs were fine in the long run. Yeah. Uh, and it's a very warm, like uh, nostalgic and uh, it's a pretty delightful memory. Like, you know how Proust had his like Madeleines that spiraled him down into the search of lost time? Like uh, Diet Dr. Pepper, or like the Dr. Pepper flavor does that for me a little bit. It really shoots me down a memory hole. And that's no a one, complex emotion, but... No one has ever answered the question so thoroughly <laughs> and so beautifully. So, Rick, I'm so glad that we're getting rid of it here. I, yeah. I think that's what we're doing. Well, that I, was think, it. I think that this, this que the way we posed the question, instead of just rating it, elicited the response. <laughs> I think that was a team effort. But it, it is a, a it, it's synergy, a high but... it's a high bar to set for us asking that question in the future. Oh my goodness! Boogie Night Sorry, says guys. Boogie Night says I thought you were talking about your kinship with Ferraris, and I thought you were talking about the car. Well, I was talking about the car and talking about the drink and the connection. And Boogie also says that was art. Uh, yeah, Rick, you did have like three tabs open in that conversation. I, I, and I, I, I never even got back to the point, I realized. And not tab the soda for the rest. Yeah, no. Um, yeah, I, I, I mean, I share a memory based thing with a family member. Like I said, my mom was a big Dr. Pepper fan. Just years and years and years spent of just like, oh, we're at the store. What drinks are we getting? We got to get mama Dr. Pepper. Yep. So mm -hmm. there's just that will carry with me forever and there's just something about now th here comes this i we were a two liter family ah let's see a lot of people are all about them cans when we got cans we we're like yo it's gonna be a crazy weekend we got cans <laughs> we'd always get the two liter which is a subpar way to present and drink soda it is no it is yeah yeah, yeah. It's i'm glad you know that. To do it. it's terrible for the environment everything about it's bad however that's what i know uh -huh. and we still get <laughs> I still get two liters to this day. I hate to say, but there's something about holding a Dr. Pepper two liter that does feel very comforting. Yeah, it's like, it's like holding a big, like com comfy, like watermelon. It just has that same heft, and like when you have to carry it through the store because you like filled up your basket already. Holding it by the top part actually sucks and hurts your hand a lot, so you kind of just cradle it like a baby. It's like, <laughs> like a football. and it's like kind of. Yeah. like tensile yeah. a little bit like you yes, can feel no, the no. soft give of the bottle and, yes oh or if it's like too hard though then you're like okay we got to be careful with this mf yeah honestly, historically speaking opening up a dr pepper bottle like bro you got to be so careful with two that. liters can get out of hand quickly that's yeah. concentrated quickly. shit yeah. yeah 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 it's scary so anyway uh i just i feel i feel so i feel warm boogie nights is enjoying it in our chat you know uh -huh. i just think that Dr. Pepper doesn't get the love it deserves. Coke steals the show, and Coke is um, incredible. I love it, but DP all the way. So, but isn't that part of Dr. Pepper's charm? Is that it's sort of like uh, the Dark Knight of sodas? <laughs> like, or sorry, I said Dark Knight, but I meant Dark Horse. Uh, <laughs> no, it's but the both, dark maybe. It's, it's the Dark Knight. Yeah, <laughs> it's like the soda that like like everyone loves a Coke, and but Snapple's then, like, the Joker. Uh, yes, <laughs> I thought Pepsi might be the Joker, but yeah, definitely. <laughs> See, Cola jokers. Yeah. yeah. We were a big Pepsi household, so I'm just going to mm. keep my... Yeah. Uh, yeah. Hey. And, and I, I mean, I, I'll try to keep this brief. Uh, and uh, because you guys really said all it was need to be, needed to be said about it. Because, like, the reason that I started to get into Dr. Pepper as a child was because of the historical significance and because of the people themselves who were into it. Yeah. You know, like the people collect like Dr. Pepper stuff and and there's kind of like this whole like old timey vibe. And the, the people that, you know, I always thought that the people that drank Dr. Pepper, you know, the person that was at the at the fountain underneath the Dr. Pepper nozzle always just was like a little classier than they knew than any of the other people that got any of the other drinks. So true. So I just looked at that in the world and realized that that's like kind of more the lane I wanted to be in for my life and like occasionally re ratchet that shit up and get like a Mountain Dew. But, but like as, as like the base drink, the base soda Rick is like a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a Dr. Pepper guy. Yeah. So it's almost like a subculture. Yeah. 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 And it's better. Yeah. It's, just, it's just, a, it's just a better one. Yeah. 
All right. I have to say, I do think this is the longest we've ever talked about a drink on this show. <laughs> we are 10 minutes before our break. Normally we're like, you know, I think Rick and I do just fine. But normally we're like, okay, how do we like bullshit for like another 10? How can we vamp a little bit just yeah. to like get across the end? <laughs> I have a lot of opinions about food stuff. And so totally. I like watched art brunches like because I'm interested, but also because I was like, I know I have one of these coming up. I want to prepare. And the thing I've been most excited about is uh, canned crucible. Yes. Great. Oh, good. Because <laughs> I've been very afraid that everyone's like, why the fuck are we here? <laughs> All week I was like, I wonder what Jake's going to bring me. Yeah. <laughs> I can't wait to see what we're going to be drinking. <laughs> I was so excited. Yeah. And with your Joker voice? That was kind yeah. of a Joker voice. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I just really like to lean into this microphone. I do this a yeah. lot when I'm lecturing online too and just like get a little asmr you know uh that's that, um... that's, that's my internal monologue all the time <laughs> well so i think like it's fitting excellent... i think you're the only <laughs> fan of the can crucible and and i, I th we've been really trying to revamp it and i think that this this was a good proof of concept of how we move forward with i don't think it needs does. that much revamping though it's yeah. a beautiful thing to like ask an artist talk about a soda i think that that's a really cool idea i want to focus more on the talking about the soda rather than trying to put this this like obscure quantifiable number on it. Yeah. And I think that you knocked it out of the park today, Matt. Yeah. Yeah. I'm glad that I could be your it's a proof uh, of concept. Yeah, proof of concept. Yeah, yeah. this is a pilot right. moment. Yeah. This is a pilot moment. Thank you guys. Thank you everyone for being here for the yes. T Green Girl <laughs> says L O L the only fan of the can crucible. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> Great. <laughs> I uh, feel sort of that hurt a little bit. T Green Girl. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> we're all feeling we're all feeling the astringent buzz of a soda in the back of I our also, throats right now. I am feeling the caffeine from this. Like it, it is pretty uh -huh. caffeinated. Yeah. I'll just say that. Yeah. Uh, and I'm pretty caffeine sensitive, so watch out. There's juice yeah. in the juice. I do yeah. want to read Boogie Nights. Thoroughly enjoyed hearing the Dr. Pepper stenalgic moment. Uh, amazing how taste and smell can take us back to these mundane, sentimental moments. Yep. Yeah. I bet, That's real yeah. love. So, That's real love. Um, Can we just talk about, though, how we're reviewing this beverage, but all we're talking about is yeah. Dr. Pepper? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think yeah. that that's really important. That says a lot about how this beverage is like a proxy. I'm sorry. I could go all day about this. No, but it's like, thanks, Zevia. Now we're yeah. just going to talk about Dr. Pepper. Dr. Pepper. Like, it's a, if a, re it's a referential beverage, which I think well, is... And, and the other thing that we haven't touched at all, which maybe we don't have time, but there's like the zillion offshoots of Dr. Somebody. Uh -huh. yep. or like, oh, you God, know, I Dr. love it. Dr. Thunder and... Yeah, Doctor yeah. Shasta. Yeah, Doctor Shasta. <laughs> yeah, real ones now. Yeah. Um, um, yeah. <laughs> Rick, am I able to get through my thing really quick? Do you think? I, I well, we gotta ask: Is it crushable? Oh yes, that's right. We get that's the whole thing. Doctor Bolo, Doctor Bob, Food Club, Doctor Now, Real <laughs> Doctor, Doctor Thunder is the best one. Doctor Right. Doctor Thunder's the best one. Doctor Thunder, yeah. Doctor Shasta Doctor Thunder is. <laughs> Dr. Shasta is just like, Costco? Is, Where do you get that? it's just, it's going too easy. Dr. Thunder <laughs> took effort. Yeah. Okay. So we did that. Uh, yes or no, real quick round table. Is it crushable? I could only have half of one of these personally. Oh. So I don't think that means it's crushable. Like there's a lot of caffeine, uh, very astringent in my mouth. I have been having to drink water in between because mm -hmm. it's like really occupying a lot of mouth space for me. So not well, crushable not for me, crushable. but deeply, deeply enjoyable. Mm. Yeah. Jake, I, is it crushable? I, I crushed two. You did? So it? limitedly crushable, yes. But ultimately, yes. Just now you drank two? No, I just had the oh. one. I kind of Oh, oh I thought you said okay. you had already drank oh, two. I was like, damn, I, Jake. <laughs> I just hit me real quick, popped another one real fast. It's your, gonna... it's your birthday, man. Go for it. <laughs> yeah, live a little. Like crazy. Oh, you could like make a Dr. Pepper cake. Maybe we should make a Dr. Pepper cake for Jake sometime. Oh my god, so smart. <clears throat> uh, that'd be incredible. Rick, crushable. I think it's yeah, I think it's crushable. I think it's crushable. It yeah, yeah. hundred percent. Um all right, Jake. Uh, I'm gonna send it over to you for your lightning <laughs> lightning round uh Astro Nook if you want. Here we go. Or do we wanna right. just yeah, I think you, I think we can do it. We can Let's go a little over. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Well, anyway, welcome everyone to the Astro Nook. Matt, welcome to the Astro Lounge. I mean, that's really what we should call it to reference Smash. Oh Mouth. yeah, that's Duh. probably why I can't get the name right because we needed a new name. Because <laughs> you want to say the thing. Um, you let me know ahead of time that you are a Virgo, and yep. as you often note each time that you are a textbook Virgo, which yep. I, I love 
that for us. Um, that means that you're an earth sign. You have the quality of being mutable, which I am a mutable water sign as a Pisces. So I feel like there's a, a kinship there. Uh, greatest all com compatibility of other people would be a Pisces. What's up? And a Cancer, which is another water sign. So again, I thought Capricorn was in there too, right? I imagine it is. I get along as a Pisces with Capricorns a lot. I have a ton of them in my life, like truly the most prevalent sign. So it would make sense that if we are, then you would be as well. Yeah. And this is just some site. But um, quickly, the rappers that you have a kinship to of a similar uh, vibe. You've got Lil Yachty, Lil Tekka, Wiz Khalifa, Easy E, Famous Dex. We've got Flo Rida, 2 Change, Ugly God, Ludacris, Nas, Sheck Wes, uh, Red Foo from, uh, what is it, that LMAO? What do they call them? LMFAO? Yeah. 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 <laughs> uh, Skepta. <laughs> Lamau. British influence there. Wale. Um, Any of those Foxy stand out to Brown? you? Two Chains. Yeah. Two Chains? Big Two Chains fan? Uh, I'm not a huge, like, I'm not a huge rap fan, but as from what I, I'm, like, what I know about Two Chains, he's yeah. a pretty interesting figure. Getting like, drunk and high at the same time, drinking champagne, champagne on an on airplane. airplane. Yeah. That's a really uh, good line. Yeah. All I know is that he's like also, wasn't he like uh, incredibly literary while he was at college? Like he like, uh, I'm, I feel like there's some sort of edge where Two Chain was like, uh, he's <clears throat> he's an intellectual. Yeah. See. Yeah. He's very academic. Um, yeah. Got really good grades. English. Yeah. He's he's yep. super super smart. Yep. Su yeah. And also like, he he took that punchline rapping to just. You know, after after like Lil Wayne and Nicki, I, and and Two Chains was going at the same time, but I feel like Two Chains took that punchline style of rapping, just like and twisted in on itself and into these like really beautiful nautical knots. And yeah. uh, he he really he really did that. He really did that. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of people that I think I wouldn't say bite. I would say are influenced by that style now that we just like take for granted. Like, oh, that's just like. They feel like 21 Savage is kind of that vibe. Like other people that are kind of just like, but 2 Chains is just even more free in it. Like it's just clear. Like mm -hmm. his lines are just like, just bars. I mean, my, they just make sense. It my favorite sense. 2 Chains moment is when he broke his leg right before tour. And then he got a custom kitted out wheelchair with Dayton's yep. on it. Uh, <laughs> yeah. For the Pretty Girls Love Trap Music tour. Uh, it's a really, really good wheelchair. So That's um, yeah, I interrupted you there, Jake, but. No, no, no. Keep we, it going. We, we rarely get to explore the rappers, actually, and I really wish we would do that more, actually. Um, so we're just rewriting treats. the whole show live today. Yeah, we're just, this is, we're just spin arting this whole thing. <laughs> I love it. Um, some, again, now this is, this is in the world. It says that some strengths and weaknesses, who's to say which are what, loyal, analytical, uh, shyness, worry, hardworking, practical, overly critical of yourself or others, all work and no play. Um, so with those kind of in mind, those strengths, those weaknesses, however you may say. Oh, we, we never mentioned this before, but I think I want to add this. I think mm. this is interesting. Virgo's likes and dislikes. And I'm curious if this makes sense too. Uh, animals, you, these are likes. Animals, healthy foods, books, nature, cleanliness. I feel like that is like. That's absolutely my brand. That's yeah. my brand. <laughs> <laughs> I have yeah. ever heard someone. It didn't Virgo mean to leak the title of your next album. Yeah, you, <laughs> Sorry, I feel dude. so seen right now. <laughs> Uh, Virgo dislikes rudeness. Oh, I hate it. Asking for help? No, I, that ask for help. That's great. I um, that's, yeah. Okay. Taking center stage. I feel like you like mixed, like mixed yeah. feelings. Mixed feelings. Like let's all have our time in in the sun, including yeah, us. yeah, yeah. That's yeah, where yeah, yeah. Like comes from. Yeah, so, I like that. I guess, and I, I I think we're still reworking this a bit too. But like these strengths and weaknesses. I mean, I don't know, like. Do you feel like those have influenced your work in any way? Like being loyal, but also worrying, but like, I feel like you are <laughs> practical and hardworking. Uh, worrying is a huge part of my, my work. And so <laughs> it's part of my MO. Yeah. Uh, but it's also a part that I have like tried really hard to like work with and also against like learning how to uh, coexist with the worrying that goes along with mm -hmm. making work has been a huge part of my process in the last few years. So I can definitely relate to that. Um, like, uh, I don't know. Go ahead. Yeah. I you had like a question. Or a, a very high output person, but never is the output seemingly like unthoughtful. 
Like it's always like this is a thing. I've but heard. you don't see all the shit that I make that I don't share. Exactly. Which I'm curious about that. Is that something that you wish that you just threw more stuff out into the world? As no, a- absolutely not. I actually talked to Rick about this earlier, but I am like very firm believer in not sharing everything I make. I have like so much stuff that I will never share. And not in any way that it's precious to me, but it's that uh, I uh, I think that it shows, it amplifies the work that you do share to not share everything, both musically, yes. creatively, artistically, memes. Like there's all of this stuff that I make that I don't share on social or through any sort of like public avenue. And that's part of the process for me is to make it and then not share it because it's like workshopping something for myself. Mm. Yeah. Yep. Well, and I, I think like, that's I, also probably very Virgo. <laughs> <laughs> I was just waiting to see how long it could go until I go typical Virgo. Yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. And yeah. I think you just did it for us. So yeah. So anyway, I feel like, I feel like that nook has been crannied. That sounds good. Uh, should yep. we should we head into our first break real quick? I think so. Yeah. Okay. Um, Denise says Virgos are ruled by Mercury, god of communication, wordsmiths. Yeah. I teach in a media studies department and studied poetry, so way to make me feel seen. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> also, so, Mercury in, Mercury in retrograde. I tried to not believe in, but every Mercury in retrograde, I'm like, I feel like shit. What the like fuck is weeks. going on? And then it, I look at the Google calendar it. and I'm like, oh, this sucks. So yeah. <laughs> Great. I don't uh, believe in it, but I feel you. it every time. <laughs> so, so yeah, we are going to come up on our first break here. And when we come back from the break, I think we're going to get into this. I mean, I don't think. I actually know. We are going to get into the more art-centered, art-centric part of the conversation. I hope you all have been enjoying everything so far. I'm going to switch to my view. Thanks for everyone for tuning in so far. Studio Space, it's good to have you here. T Green Girl, Denise... Um, always a pleasure. Boogie Nights, always a pleasure. Uh, if you are new to Twitch or new to streaming, you can ask us questions at any time over there in the chat and we'll be really nice to you. Um, we're going to take a quick 10 minute break so we can, uh, just have a little time to connect, reconnect on this 10 minute break. Um, for you all, I encourage you to, uh, what do I encourage you to listen to a song that you really like? And that'll prime your music mind. And I'm going to do that too because I need to get into this this music mind. I think Jake and Matt are going to run away with from it, it uh, run away with it if if I don't if I don't step my game up real quick. So I have some <laughs> serious planning to do. I'll be back at eleven twelve.
I feel like I'm in Wayne's world right now. Hello, everyone. Welcome back. We are here. I hope you had a great break. Uh, we did. Um, we're having a, we're having trouble, like you know, saving the good content for the show. But like everything is content, you know. Uh, I don't think we're gonna have any any lack of good stuff to talk about today. Um, thanks for everyone for sticking around across the break, and uh, let's kick it back over over to the homies. Welcome back, y'all. Hello. Uh, we were, you know, discussing bugs and birds and various creatures of life. Um, I didn't actually listen to a song over the break, so I, <laughs> I, uh, I really kind of set myself up for failure there. Uh, ten minutes seems to fly by. Um, oh my god! Every time we are going to get back into the conversation here, and um, for those of you just joining us, I want to read uh, uh, Matt's bio again. Uh, Matthew Sage is an American artist and educator. He works with audio, video, text, and image. His work implores the amorphous spaces between historical artistic publishing models and democratized digital media environments. He ran Patient Sounds, a record label for 10 years, and released more than 140 art objects from artists around the world in that decade. He now runs Cached Media, Cached.media, an intermedia platform producing and distributing intermedia art objects. He lives in Chicago where he teaches and works in his garden. Um, obviously, thank you for sending that bio over. And I, I think it, you know, makes makes pretty clear a small sample of the things that you do uh, and implies kind of the sense of the larger uh, sample of things that you do that may not fit inside of a bio. Um, one of the things that really jumped out to me from that, and uh, I think is a good starting point, it's a, it's a meta starting point, Patient Sounds. And I went over to the website, and this this is what we're met with when, <laughs> when you go over to the website. Oh, man. <laughs> and... Um, it, it's a, it's beautiful that the website still exists and and it, it has this like eulogy. A funny story for me is I used to run a magazine called Third Wave Magazine, and it was a um, a magazine for the float industry, which I used to work in, a sensory deprivation tank industry. So we created uh, there was the second international float magazine. The first was made in the 70s by the people who actually invented the commercial float tank. So we were, we were working with them to create a new magazine um, based off of what they did and bring it into this present moment. And we worked on it for a year. We had, um, we had three, three magazines released in that year. And I had some other friends in the float industry who were doing this project, uh, this podcast project, where they made a podcast about different um, experiences in the float industry every single day. So they did 365 one-hour podcasts. Whoa. And they're nuts. They're nuts, right? At, yeah. the, at the end of that year, they had a live call-in show where you could call in and ask them any question. And it was the last episode of their podcast. The, the question I called in and asked them was – how you know how do you end things like what are the things that you think about and what are the things that you have to manage when you come to the end of things because we're all obviously so good at beginning new things and and ending things and ending things properly is something that you're very fortunate to even have the ability to do that it doesn't just dissolve into obscurity in your life that you yeah. have a, have a moment to say goodbye and uh, that was that was like a a month before we were announcing the end of our magazine um, and so I, I kind of want to start in this place with you, Matt, and I don't even really know what Patient Sounds was. All I know is that it no longer is. I was never a part of that. And we come to this conversation as, as me only ever knowing it as this thing that was or this thing that was dead. So I want to just kind of start and like extend the same question to you, and you can take it um, at any part in, in your history that you want. But like, what was the experience like ending Patient Sounds? Uh, that's a super good question. And it's one that like I deal with people asking, especially the people who I had worked with through the tenure of the project, like they had a lot of questions about why I was stopping mm. patient sounds. And so I sort of had to like, 
I had to reckon with it a lot for myself in order to give them a decent answer, I think. <laughs> Uh, because I also felt sort of responsible to these artists whose work I'd been representing throughout the decade that I was doing it. Yeah. And so for me, Patient Sounds Ending was about um, seeing a decade of work and seeing that as a really neat container for a project. And so uh, I saw sort of like several ways that it could have gone. The first being that I could have let it fizzle out or sort of like, flush into obscurity after losing steam or getting burned out um like without any sort of like claim on primacy saying that patient sounds was like the first tape label because it absolutely obviously wasn't but like patient sounds was a label that came into the limelight in however way that it, like the ways that it did through the sort of like cassette boom mm -hmm. and i watched that sector changed so much in the 10 years that I was working in it that I was sort of like this has been really fun but I kind of want to try something different and I don't know if it would be true to the brand to like completely pivot patient sounds into a different medium and so instead I'm going to take this 10-year like catalog which I also often call the canon like I took this 10-year canon of stuff that I worked with people and I put it in a container and was like this is done it was a blast I'm going to try something different now. And so ending it was as much about a respect for the work that I had the privilege of sharing by other artists as it was about sort of like uh, honoring Patient Sounds as a project and trying to remain true to what that brand and that sort of like identity as a project was about from the beginning, which was this like renegade spirit and this trying to... Uh, make our own rules to get tapes into the world for a while. So I ended it because it felt like it was the right thing to do for the project and also for myself. Yeah. Oh, we don't have Jake. Jake, we lost your audio. Hello. Hello. Yep. Check. There we go. Um, that it's really interesting in terms of like the real worldness of you ending patient sounds because so many things as you can see that that date because that was like the end of november or the end of 2019 excuse me yeah right? september ish yeah okay because you and i met officially in person for the first time at and i have it over here on the weekend november 15th through the 17th it was sunday so it was the 17th art book uh, fair. at the chicago art book fair in yeah. downtown chicago and that was that was the last was that the last table ling you ever did with, yeah it was with the last like it last event for patient sounds other than oh i think that still waiting show happened before that maybe okay yeah but we did a, we did an event at the hideout in here in chicago which is like a fantastic venue and then after that hideout show i think we did art book fair as our sort of like last hurrah yeah totally and that was the first time that we met each other yeah right well and i i felt too like i i have like a, some prints over here i wish i could pan this over i'll show it maybe in the show notes or something i don't know <laughs> we'll do an after hours for the patreon anyway um that like it was so incredibly cool to watch someone a who i knew and like very like in the distance become homies irl but then yeah. also to watch someone go th through that process of like this is my meat and potatoes and now i'm like no more and it's like whoa what, what am i getting to watch right as i meet you and watch you do this and we'll get to what you go to next after that but um i think it was really helpful for me as an artist to watch someone do that and as i've known you since that time i've struggled a lot with things ending and things like moving on and like forming new worlds that are probably pretty close to our old worlds but there's new rules involved or new limitations mm -hmm. um how have you felt like since that time with like new rules and limitations in, in your life? Like, are you feeling very like, if I do something like hmm, that feels very patient sounds like, does that come up at all? Um, I mean, it's, ob it's like ultimately going to inform every decision that I make, uh, yeah. with work that I'm making both, uh, for like my new publishing venture and also for myself. But, um, I think that I've, I love rules. And there was like a really, uh, there was a really like sort of, I think patient sounds for me was a chance to sort of learn how to make rules for these kinds of projects because I started it when I was very young. I was like 22 or something. And so uh, to start this 
this brand that would run for a decade and sort of like negotiate running a brand for a decade uh, that eventually became like an on the books business. Like that project demanded that I learn how to make rules and write a business plan and like do my taxes and all this kind of stuff. And so I learned a lot about that early on and also went from like stars in my eyes. I'm going to run a record label to like, uh, dread on my face i run a record label it was like a very it's a 10 year long process and i loved so much of it and i learned a lot about rules so that way now that i'm in cash doing that project i have been very quick to say like these are boundaries these are rules uh i also think like there's a huge tendency for people who are running cottage industries like record labels or publishing companies to sort of like see rules or contracts as a sort of disqualifier for being DIY. Like, oh, you run a small publisher, you present an artist with a contract. It's like, oh, is this like, oh, this is business. I think that there's like a recoil that happens with people with that a lot. And so I wrote up a series of rules for Cached and I present them to artists that I'm collaborating with as a set of rules, but like board games require rules in order to function. And so I sort of paint it that way to them. Like, these are the rules for the game. I really want to play this game with you uh, and you get to play with me and we're going to play this game together. And if we're going to do this, then like, here's a set of rules about how this is going to work, both like aesthetically and conceptually and financially. Uh, there's things that I have that are important to my brand. And I want you to know that before we start a single thing together. So you can sort of know how you're going to lean into the rules. And then also, I think rules are amazing because you know where you can lean in and bend and break rules. And, or like bend bend in best cases. And then sometimes break in ultimate best cases. Like if you know what the rules are and then you break it in a, in a way that's really exciting to me as a collaborator, I can be like, damn, that was a good reason to break that rule. And then... Uh, it sets a precedence for understanding that that's a possibility. But uh, yeah, I think a lot of what happened with me closing patient sounds was realizing that I needed a little bit more rules to make it clear for everybody involved about how it was going to run. Mm. So myself what, included. What I'm detecting in that is, is that um, giving yourself a, a clear, a clean break, or or giving yourself a new opportunity to uh, lay the ground rules, kind of can help clean up the mess you made over yeah. the course of ten years of like, like fuck it, let's just make something, and then and then that like, that can fly for a long time, but it doesn't it doesn't like really fly forever, uh, and and like the the dirtiness <laughs> that can come from just making things with other people and and having having you change over the course of that 10 years something that you were okay with five years ago might not be the you, you probably aren't okay with now um and it can be kind of difficult to manage that messiness that happens inside of organizations as time goes on so it, it really feels like this was a absolutely. way for you to kind of clean up that structure yeah absolutely and also like when you have a brand like Patient Sounds, and it's obviously not like, you know, a Hallmark legacy, whatever brand, like a million people don't know about it or whatever, but people do have a relationship with that brand. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think that I uh, am accountable to them as the person who operates that brand, but they don't necessarily know that it's me that's accountable for that. It's just that Patient Sounds is this specific thing. And I knew that I wasn't really interested in offering that specific thing in the same way anymore. Mm -hmm. And I could go through the process of like a rebrand and then like explaining the rebrand and all this kind of stuff. But to me, what felt the most natural was to say like, that project's done. And I think it gives the, the fan base and also the artists who are involved a kind of understanding of closure too. And to say like, like we all did this thing, we did it together. We're going to do something different. And like, maybe some of y'all are going to be involved in whatever is next, but like, let's just put this thing in a container and put it on a shelf and like appreciate that it's in a container on a shelf. And I think that kind of creative closure isn't afforded to a lot of people, both on the creator yeah. side and on the curatorial side. It's usually like this thing ended because we ran out of money and the website is going to stay up forever and no one's going to update it anymore. And I uh, did not really want to have that be how, because I put so much of myself into Patient Sounds and I wanted to honor the work that I did 
as much as the work of the people who I collaborated with by saying like, let's respect this brand and stop it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Which stop I think is like, yeah, go ahead, Jay. Here's your point. I'm so sorry. Uh, it's just, it's a complicated thing too. Uh, I, I, so re <laughs> I received a lot of backlash. I received backlash really? from stopping patient sounds too. Yeah. From wow. people. Yeah. Both uh, friends and also like friends and collaborators and strangers. Oh. So yeah. The stranger backlash is a different world probably. <laughs> A yeah, lot of and like I was not expecting it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It, it, and you know, I mean, I think that working publicly as an artist and putting your work out there does kind of like necessitate those responses at some point, especially if you're doing well. You know, like that's base, best case scenario is is that you come up against these conflicts about uh, perception and uh, other people's partial ownership inside of an idea, and you know, and that's that's fair. That's fair. That's what we're asking people to do. Um, and I, I think that, you know, this touches on a lot of ideas also with, for the travel agency and, and the reason why, like, we structure this the way that we structure it is, is because, like, we're trying to create fertile ground for collaborations that can exist and move through time. But also you have to build in these breaks. You have to build in these times to break away from the expectation. Because, like, if, if, your, if your expectations change and others remain the same and like it's a losing battle you you, you know yeah. you, you can't you can't continue to make something that no longer feels authentic because then all you do is is challenge challenge the legacy of of the work that you made um, absolutely yep so i i respect that and um we are not it, it's not the same reason i bring this up i don't plan on ending the travel agency in a month uh, we're not doing the third wave magazine thing here. Here we go, everyone. It's been fun. <laughs> the break next week is going to last yeah, forever. We are going to take a break next week. We're taking but... a break next yeah. week. Yeah. I thought we were on a break. Okay. Um, <laughs> I, I, I do have to bring up this next slide, and, and I know we could continue continue on that, but I think um, on the on the opposite side of of reason, I do want to bring up uh, this slide here and um, begin to kind of discuss like this in, inside of this context of like growing things, nurturing things, but also like maintaining things. Uh, what, what did I do? <laughs> no, exactly. Growing and nurturing literally yeah. and metaphorically. Oh, am I being, <laughs> it was just too, am I being lame? No, no, no. It was so, it was, never mind. I ruined it. Keep going. <laughs> am I being cool? <laughs> No, you're doing great. No, I love it. No, it's, it was a it was a positive, but um, it was oh. an inclusive one. Okay, I, I I don't want to make a joke of it, but it it Not is it is okay. It started as a joke, so yeah. that's fine. Yeah, yeah. No, that's great. It's I'm, fine. I'm happy. Yeah. I'm happy if it's a joke, but it 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 is it it is like the op it is like this opposite ridiculous thing. It's like this this uh, absurd thing that comes out of uh, what we're talking about is like kind of a similar approach to. Uh, cultivating communities and um, and you know I, I I think that like birds bugs or fish is is a is a question that we discussed um, that that Matt brought to us off stream that we should discuss at some other time. But like that's Lynette you, that's Lynette's question though. That's my wife's question. Yeah, just for the record, give Lynette that's props. Her, that's her material. So give Lynette and props. We should, get, we should get people in the chat on that. Which yeah. team are you? Birds bugs or Seep specifically. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that'll take us dwellers. down a whole rabbit hole. But this one is specifically about bugs. Well, just, just throw in the chat. Just get that going. Just we don't even have to address it. Just it's there. <laughs> and um, and I know that this created a really strong sense of community between you and Jake. This unmown patch is like the first thing that Jake brought up to me about you. And the, this is like what Jake led with was was I'm this. So, work. I'm so fascinated by the response to this thing. <laughs> I don't know why it was so. Should I like give the backstory for the work? First? I think Jake should. Okay. Well, Matt, you're never gonna have to jump in on this, but I feel like it was like it's just okay. Without like no one like without Jake, me take being us on a journey. <laughs> when I saw this piece, it was also equally like the most me thing. Not to make it about me. But like something as so simple and beautiful as just like, I'm just going to mow a strip of land and leave it. Um, there is just like, like it's everything I want out of a piece of 
art, frankly, because it was it took like no t- no time at all. It was simple, but it was also like devastatingly fun, but yeah. also like beautiful. It also and- took forever. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what I got out of it and why it meant so much to me. But I, I do think people should should hear like the story behind it because it is such a wonderful story, I think. But okay, so I I paint it as like a land art gag is how I started to like explain it to people uh, because I love land art and installation pieces like that. Uh, but obviously we don't have the resources to like go and, you know, move a mountain or whatever, uh, create, you know, spiral jetty. And so I uh, was mowing my lawn, which my dad uh, was a horticulturalist and a, a landscaper and a landscape ar- architect. Wow. So mowing the lawn has like a very sacred patriarchal space in my brain and my life and my heart. And so uh, I was mowing the lawn, which is a thing that I had to do as a kid. And he was very particular about how the lawn was mowed. And I was mowing my lawn here in Chicago and my mower ran out of gasoline and it ran out of gasoline while I was in the middle of doing this sort of like spiral pattern in the yard that I do. And there was just this rectangle in the middle and I was so charmed by this rectangle and was like, oh, this is fun. Uh, And then I went and got Lynette and I was like, look at this thing. And she was like, huh, that's fun. And I was like, I think I'm gonna leave it. And she was like, cool. So then I sort of like, I, I retconned it. And so I sort of like sat on a chair in my backyard and looked at it for a while and just thought about what it could mean, like its potentials. And didn't necessarily go in with that uh, conceptual thinking about I was going to do this land art gag. I like my mower and out of gas. And then I sort of had to sit down and make sense of what I saw and why it was so charming to me. Mm -hmm. And then I had all of this stuff that came up as I was sitting there looking at it and was like, this piece has legs. It's hilarious. I'm going to just like not mow this patch of grass in my yard all summer and see what happens. Mm -hmm. And so that's where it came from. And then In the process, I learned that it was as much about documentation as it was about execution. It was also this idea of like uh, patience, like letting a thing expand over time, define itself over time. Uh, It was so fun. (laughs) Uh, I don't know. That's sort of the story. I also see it as like a direct affront to like Eurocentric patriarchal landscape culture and like uh monoculture grass and there's definitely like an ecological like tongue-in-cheek thing happening with it Mm, yeah especially with the outcome which i couldn't have planned this any better but it was like overrun by an invasive species and so it killed my yard like in theory (laughs) in theory leaving this piece of grass unmowed should have helped reestablish habitat but instead, this like creeping Charlie that you see in most of the pictures uh, is an invasive species, and it killed all of the grass in my yard. Mm. And so I think that there's like a, a lot happened in this like five by twelve patch of grass. Mm. My dogs also shit in it a lot. <laughs> <laughs> you risked it all for yeah. the art, for the world. Yeah. Um, okay. So many things. And Rick, please interrupt me and jump no, this in is you your this is your moment <laughs> also i want to say that the jake did uh a performance if you will of unmown strip even though it wasn't as long uh but you did do a performance of unmown strip and i was so tickled by that it like really it made me see that this piece uh was more than maybe just a gag in a way that was really nice yeah that's i mean like and that's exactly it like that is the beauty to me of like i can do it too And the only, like, I feel like the only, like, limitation is to properly cite who did it. That's what I would want, is just to, like, add to a legacy of people doing it. And it would lose all value if I, like, didn't tag you. It's, like, dumb as that sounds. But, like, I, because I want people to understand and see where this came from. And literally, what was so interesting, too, so this is a... a, (laughs) Rick, just talk about your piece. (laughs) (laughs) To talk about my, you know, version of it is I did it in the front yard, which added a whole new social context to it. Because when I left it... I had neighbors that were around that like weren't talking to me, but I definitely felt the weight of them being like, it makes people, it's a polarizing (laughs) piece of work in a way that you would never think you would never think it's the the Mohawk. I mean, the Mohawk is is like a classic, uh, (laughs) you know, like counterculture hairstyle. Yeah. Right. 
Well, yeah. And so for, just for the sake of understanding the situation for me, I, I, I did this. I got my camera out. I took two or three pictures and then I mowed it immediately mm -hmm. because also some part of me was like, well, a like my mom, this is my mom's house in St. Louis. She was trying to sell her home, which is now sold. But like I was like, I need to like this isn't my place. <laughs> um, but like to just even document it. I felt a really hard time, like trying to find the right angle to get yeah. it. Uh -huh. So I think like from that space of like, okay, how can I share this very like in-person thing that you can enjoy that is completely seismically different as a vibe in person, but then to document it in a way that like gets the joy across. I, I like, I had took, ended up taking a lot of like iPhone pictures to like try to like test it before I got the, I took a film picture of it. So this was one, I think the one, I think I should have two on that post, but that was the one that I felt like, actually told and also like time of day which yeah it's huge like shadow it's actually more about the shadow than it is about the height of the grass like capturing or documenting the work is more about it's like a presence and absence thing which i think is really interesting it's so it was hard it was really yeah. hard yeah. um so it's just I, I mean it's just one of those things where i just i feel like it, it hit perfect like 100 percent threshold of what an art piece could be <laughs> that means, then, that means so like, much <laughs> that's the impossible goal like it's oh we're always like floating at like 99 or something like this is like like it's not a home run it's a grand slam that's mm. what it is thank you so much jake i love uh, it so much <laughs> that really does mean a, a ton to me because it really was i think that's like this also goes so much into my music practice too it's like i tried for a long time to try to make work that was conceptual or like heady or like i went into stuff thinking a lot about it and i always i felt like that was the work that kept fizzling for me with both myself and my like an audience i was like put all this thought into something and share it with someone and have to explain why it was interesting and then i stopped trying to do that and was just i started having fun more in my like my art studio and my personal art practice and in that like having fun and not really trying to think too much about a piece of work that's where i was finding uh work that was sparking joy, Marie Kondo, whatever. Uh, but you know, like, like bringing an audience joy and then also bringing myself joy, like the work that I was thinking less about, I was feeling more pleasure with. And so then like seeing that that also was happening with audiences is I was like, oh, that's like, that seems to be really interesting. Maybe I can love conceptual art because I there's so much conceptual art that I find really interesting and fascinating, but maybe that's not the mode that I should work in, which was also a sort of like, uh, there's a sort of ownership in making art that you sort of have to learn maybe the work that you're maybe not better or worse at, but the work that you seem to find the most fulfilling. And I think I find work most fulfilling when I'm playing. I have totally. to play in order to make the work that I love to do. And I love to like do studio visits with my friends who are making really conceptual work and talk to them about all of that. Uh, but I am definitely a, a retcon person, like retroactive concept. Like I make something and then I get to sit with it and think about why I had fun doing that thing. And then I sort of uh, give way to um, impulse in those spaces. And then impulse seems to clear up some space it's like a runway. Like I can land on that impulse and then I can turn around and say like, okay, where am I? And figure it out. Totally. Yeah. Well, and it makes sense that natural that a lot of like, for instance, I feel like your audio or music based work is like improvisation yeah. a lot. So that like this, that like, where does that go in a space outside of the sonic realm? You know, that like the play of like the fucking mower ran out of gas, <laughs> you know, like <laughs> the okay. string broke. Yeah. The string broke on the guitar. What do I do now? The drummer exploded. Okay, what do we do now? You know, like yeah. that's a little, a little rock show thing. Um, but RIP, yeah, I just... RIP for the drummer. <laughs> um, but yeah, Some I just F's in I the think chat like for the drummer. <laughs> um, but anyway, continue. I just I think that that it clearly is prevalent in your life, and I think speaks to the type of artist that you are. Absolutely. Yeah, I want to I want to jump in on that, and 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 and. Uh, it's 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 community based practice i think that is is what is revealed is revealed by that type of um feedback loop that you're creating is is this community i mean on on in certain ways like the retcon but that that comes from a sense of realization and a sense of sharing and then a mm -hmm. sense of like uh cause and effect and you know pop i, I think is 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 a thing that i'm focused on a lot is like 
if if Jake could remix that song and like put it out, uh, you know, remix that image and uh, put it out, like, oh, what is what does that mean about the nature of the work? And you get into these places of like community is like so fundamental to your life and so fundamental to your practice. Yeah, definitely. And I think also, um, I don't know. I don't have much to say. You nailed it. Yeah. <laughs> Great. <laughs> but I also think like, uh, music is such a strange thing and that it's so temporal. Mm -hmm. Like you can make an unknown strip and it's static, but it also is always growing. But like, part of the work is taking a picture, you know? Mm -hmm. And then the documentation of it is the thing that stays forever. Or like a painting is static. Like you make a painting, obviously it's going to age over however long and it's going to look different under different light during different times of the day. But that image doesn't essentially change. But like with music, uh, and also you can look at a painting for a second or look at a painting for 20 hours straight as a sort of like, you know, uh, as an experiment. But with music, you make a song, someone has to sit down or they don't have to. And that's part of the requirement. Like uh, it's a temporal experience. Like it requires an audience to sit through three and a half minutes of something, whether the audience is the person who's making it working in the studio, obsessing over like a single cut or playing it to a party of people who aren't even really listening to the music or to someone who's like obsessively detail orientedly listening to your music on the train on their commute. And it's like a part of their day. Like uh, music requires time in a way that so many other like more traditional art practices maybe don't. And so I, that's one of the things I think is like uh, I am trying with my music practice. And I think this rubs off into all of my other art practices too, to find a way to be hospitable in that space. Mm, like yeah. if you're going to ask someone to spend four minutes of time with something that you've made, I think that there's this like uh, four minutes doesn't seem like a long time, but it also can be a really long, a time, long time, you know? And so I, uh, I think that making work accessible or hot, like hospitable is really important to me. And so I think that there are, and that's community oriented, I think, like in what Rick was saying, like, I'm interested in making sure that people feel invited into what I'm doing in a way that's also like, like, maybe you don't necessarily have to understand the mechanics of why I made what I made, but I want you to find like a little something exciting in what I'm making before, as you spend this three or four minutes with me, whether it's a song or a photograph or whatever, you know, I, I think that hospitality is really important to me. Uh, and like a lot of my favorite artists aren't necess necessarily hospitable makers. And I think that that's fine too. <laughs> uh, but I like to, I strive to do that in my work. I feel like that's so interesting on the idea of like hospitable makers, because I feel like there's a lot of folks that somehow, despite like being in a cabin somewhere and making their music or their art, and then they send it out in the world. And then they're just like, they say like, you know, F off to the rest of the world. And they just kind of do their thing. And then it like explodes because like, people find their work incredible, whatever. But then there's people who like, I think, turn their canon towards the world. And they're like, I'm making this in tandem with you, whether you know it or not, mm -hmm. because I know that your experience is what I'm considering as well. Huh. Like it's a very like, like, I just feel like even like you and the grass is like, that was a duo. <laughs> Matt yeah. Stage Grass duo. Like you like you cared for it as much as like itself almost as an audience member, as much as the thing itself. Because I feel like I look at what I do a lot as like I'm not look at me, here's my work, I send it to the world. I almost feel like I don't even know how I freaking did this. So I always feel per like content like constantly in the audience of my own work. Mm. Yeah. And I feel like having that space, like there are just some artists who can be like, Yeah, I wrote like twenty songs and I have a new album out. And it's uh, my album. I wrote this. I'm like, I somehow made this happen. I don't know where this came from, but it did. Um, but I, I think that the the communal like space of canon, like how you view the audience, how you view, view community, I think is incredibly important. And I think it shows through your work. Absolutely. And this is like, I'm going to circle back really fast. This was a huge thing that was, I wanted to separate patient sounds from cached with because patient sounds became we did this thing called open window every year where uh i had an email inbox and for a month i accepted demos from anybody and everybody audio demos of albums and uh and then i would go through and it would take me about four months to listen to every single demo 
and I would listen to every second of every demo. So I would get between 100 and 200 albums on average every year. And then I would try to pick like between five and 10 of those albums to put out on cassette. And so Patient Sounds was always this like, uh, it was a project in curation where I was receiving music from strangers and then pairing that with music from friends or collaborators that I knew and putting them out next to each other because I thought it produced a sort of like interesting, like look at this thing that this person who I've never met who lives in, I don't know, wherever, like uh, South Omaha. America. Yeah, Omaha <laughs> sent me. And like uh, this person from Omaha that sent me this thing is making something that's also weirdly akin to this thing that a friend of mine who's living in LA made. Uh, and then I like to put them out together. And I realized, first of all, what a daunting task I'd set myself up with, to, like listen to all of that music every year, which was like delightful, but also exhausting. But I also realized the more I sort of like, uh, quantified what I was receiving and like zoomed out and saw a picture of what I was receiving th from these demos, 90% of the work I was getting was solo work. So it was like mostly people working alone. And a lot of them would come with like a paragraph that a person would write that was like, I've been working on this music in my bedroom for three years. And uh, I think that it's an amazing thing that I've made and I want you to put it out. And like the trust that they showed in me to send me that thing that they've spent so much time with that they've lived with is immense. And the amount of times that I had to say no to work like that because it didn't fit into my curatorial vision was also like exhausting. Ultimately, I became sort of exhausted of having to be that person who was saying no to this work that was so important to these people. And I also became tired of work that was so singular. So like, I'm the artist here. This is my thing that I made in my room alone. I didn't make it for patient sounds, but like you have this open call. So I'm going to send it to you. I got really tired of sort of like figuring out how to negotiate all of that at once. And so cashed <clears throat> the main when I was like, thinking about what I wanted to do as I continued publishing. Cause I don't know how to not publish stuff. Like I, <laughs> it's just a part of how I, it's my it's mode. Yeah. It's my mode. And so I had to figure out what I wanted to do. And I came away from a sort of like mood board session, knowing collaboration was the most important part. And so with cashed, we're never going to put out a release on CD that's musical by a solo artist it's all going to be collaborative. So like, there's never going to be a release that's attributed to one artist on CD. And like, I'm working on some book projects now. And those book projects are sort of a collaboration, both aesthetically, conceptually between myself and the book artist. So it's like this idea that we are working on this material together. Um, it's material that's being created specifically for this outlet uh, with an understanding of what this outlet sort of purpose is. And I think that that is as much for the artists and for myself as also for the audience for cash to sort of like, know, like they're dealing, like this is a collaborative work. Uh, and you're maybe like, you're invited to be a part of this collaboration because I think there's so many labels who I love, who I feel so removed from because like I, I adore them and their music is so important to me, but it's, uh, it's on a plinth and it's like, that's that label and I'll never have access to that thing. And uh, that feels, it can be isolating, I think. And I don't want to make work like that. I also feel so seen now that Rick's putting that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I like, and if you like that, then yeah. <laughs> I like what you say here. Um, where is it? Oh man. Oh yeah. Cash does not accept demo submissions but is always looking for artists and collaborators. Yep. Um, I think that really kind of like distills, and I, I'm not even really familiar with that kind of like terminology. I've never submitted a demo. I've been in bands and I've made music, but I don't, I've never like gone out for like it, what a, a demo submission is, but it, that seems like a, a form. It's a, it's a culture. Yeah. 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 And uh -huh. I like that you just say, we don't do it, but like we do do it. We do this other, <laughs> <laughs> we do this other thing. That Jake's got so something. Weird. I'm, I just, it, to me, like, it's hard to explain that I, like what Matt said and, and what that statement says is, is just it, because I feel like it's almost like we view record labels as like major businesses. And it's like, mm -hmm. you come in there, buy a product and get out. It feels very like, or like, you know, I sent a submission to Sub Pop. I hope that they like me. And then eventually they're like, yes, we like you as, you know, the kings of indie world, indie pop, we say yes. Whereas like, I think the future, but even small tape labels to some degree is like, I send you this and then they go, okay. And it's just like, 
I feel like there's almost more of like this passive acceptance that happens with cash that I think is the future of this of like like the, the where the release begins and the label label begins and like those two worlds are are mixed but then also it's like we have all these spaces to create and to share so like being on discord being on twitch being on these other platforms that are intermedia which I'll, we'll let matt go off on to. that yeah. i love that um it just there's like just if nothing else just a vibe like it can be as simple as just a vibe difference of like i think that the future of this is this passive space where it's like we are a vessel with you to show you and as you come in we move with you it's like very it's frankly very watery which yeah. i guess always but <laughs> definitely why we made these sweatshirts for sure yes. <laughs> um, which i had I think, which i had up yeah this is uh, this is the water cycle yeah um the thing too for me is like as a person who academically is interested in the history of media publishing but spe more specifically music publishing um Record labels are still following the model that was set as precedents by major labels that were established in the 50s who were like making records as subsidiary to sell not just records, but also products like, yeah. uh, you know, like uh, the payola system and the music industry system are built on consumership. And I think in so many ways even like the coolest indie rock labels are still following that same model, even though they're trying to sort of like preach a sort of like alternative independence kind of thing. Like they're still following the model that Columbia RCA set up. Right. Uh, it's just a matter of scale for them. And for me, I don't think what I'm doing is like singular or whatever. It's like not its own thing that is only cash is doing it, but I am just really tired of uh, that model, both as a listener and a fan of music. I think it's mostly as a fan too. Like I want to make the label that I would be a fan of. And I'm most interested in uh, not that, yeah. <laughs> like not, not the Columbia system, not the payola system. I'm really interested in something like Lynette, uh, my wife is uh, an artist and a brand manager, and she has this amazing talk about brand, and I have to credit her about it uh, because it's so spectacular. But she talks about how brand is sort of like it's more than just a logo. It's like your relationship to a company. It's how you how a company feels to you, not just as a consumer, but also as a human being. Like there's um, an emotional like we just talked about how we have an emotional relationship to Dr. Pepper. Like, <laughs> And so I think that like. Uh, when you operate what is essentially a brand, I think you're responsible not just for, uh, you know, a good logo or like a website that is easy to navigate, but also for uh, that like social and parasocial relationship that you have with your audience. Like you are a part of their life. When they order something from you, they want to they want it to feel special and I want to, them to feel that special feeling. And I have ordered so many things from so many of my favorite record labels and have not received even a single sticker in a box. And it's sort of disappointing to like get a package in the mail and it's just like the record and a cardboard slat to make sure that it's safe and it's sealed up and there's nothing special about it. Like that makes me feel like a consumer and not a receiver of art. And I think that that, only degrades the art objects that are in those packages. And so I'm really interested in trying to elevate the experience, both for the person who's receiving the object in the mail, whether it's like sending them extra things in an envelope or just making the envelope look cool, I think yeah. is like exciting and fun. But then also uh, for the people who are making work underneath that umbrella to know that their work is going to be sent with that kind of care. I think that that like, also is important to them. And having been, having worked with like a lot of different record labels, uh, it makes me happy to know when a label is doing that kind of thing or like spending that extra time thinking about packaging or like thinking about how it's going to go out to an audience. It makes my work feel less disposable and more important because there's so much music made every day and music does can as a musician can feel so disposable to yeah. make make something and have it just like go out into the effluvia of the musical universe and just get lost in the bubbles like you don't see everything that everybody makes and so to know that 
you can add that little extra character or like personality or hospitality to it is at the heart of why I do what I try to do for sure. Well, let's get some snaps for that. Um, <laughs> and I, I, I mean, yes, right on. And um, you're doing that. You're, you're doing that. And I think that what we uh, are going to probably be getting into in the next segment is how the decentralization of uh, uh, decentralization of media and and like what live can do for the storm of consumers and what li- you know and what tangible objects can do for uh, you know real objects for real people can yeah. can really do some different things. I I actually damn that's good. Real objects for real people. It's like a <laughs> trademark, you, trademark, trademark. You should put that on t-shirts, please. Yeah, you can have you can have it if you want. I think No, 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 no. That's yours. It's <laughs> good. I, I I buy that travel agency t-shirt. Yeah. Okay, we'll we'll rock it. You you have an object that's dropping soon. I I just got notification that our new object dropped and we haven't announced it yet. But um I think that or, or it's shipped. So, uh but but there's this other idea that I kind of want to leave us with over the break is is this idea of like inconvenience and purchasable inconvenience. I uh, I went onto your website last night onto the Bandcamp and I bought your most recent album because first of all like I have to lead the way <laughs> you know and say like go out and go buy this shit. I'm gonna put Matt links in the chat. Like I did it. That was the first music I bought. The first digital music i have bought in it has to be like five years i don't remember the last time i bought physical music and then i was i was trying to think about how i would buy a cd and how because i actually really love cds and they're beautiful the cd is sold out but like there are other cds and and i have like home pods in my house so i was trying to figure out how i would even play music from a cd and then that's when shit starts to get beautiful. So like I could have my old MacBook hooked up to like an external CD drive and I could put the CD in, my, in the external CD drive and airplay the music from the CD <laughs> to the HomePod. And like yeah. what if I just had like a stack of of CDs and just like a stable MacBook with like a beautiful stainless steel CD drive and that's where I put the CD in. And yeah. and it's going over the air, which I think creates issues for sound quality. <laughs> but we can get into that later. But like the inconvenience, like selling the beauty of that inconvenience is something that I think is definitely important to invest in and to reapproach in our lives. That huh. ju- just using consumerism for convenience, convenience-based models of consumerism, like is inherently kind of empty and detaches us from the process. But yeah. like exploring ideas about like how do i make a purchase really inconvenient on myself and then you start to get into the <laughs> dust of art yeah yeah dust, for sure uh i mean i did this for 10 years when i was selling cassette tapes during right, like right, the, yeah. the digital boom and i spent literally a decade of my life where every time i set up a merch table someone was like are these cassette tapes it's like yeah dude <laughs> every time i set up a merch booth i had like a a thing that I got used to where I was like, there's download codes inside the J card. Like it was just part of like how I operated as a business person was like, I had to explain the inconvenience of my product to people. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then I pivoted to the CD because we got a car with a CD player. And I was like (laughs) really into listening to CDs in the car, even though I could just as easily Spotify stream, like almost anything that I would be playing in the car. uh, It has, miss it. Yeah, it's a there's a weird nostalgia to it. It's also a very high quality uh, listening experience, like digital yeah. CD. Also, I think that's really important to remember is like the CD is not popular in America, but like if you go to other countries, the CD is still the preferred uh, consumption mode for music. Uh, it is incredibly convenient. Like when I was in Japan, they only wanted CDs while I was there. They were interested in vinyl and like the cassette industry is also like it's happening there. People are making and selling cassette tapes, but the CD is the preferred mode here. So like there's a regional side to it too. Uh, I know we're supposed to go on break, but yeah, uh, <laughs> it's, it's a loose break. Oh, uh, you will never take a, never take a break when we're having a good conversation. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, but yeah, I think, I think that it is a good place for a break um, because we are going to come back and get into probably more of this, uh, idea of intermedia study 
and intermedia objects and and I can see us I can see us going on with that or we might come back and talk about something completely different so I'm gonna switch over to my screen here across the break it's a it's a good opportunity to consider the ways that you inconvenience yourself and the ways that that feels good I had I had this idea and, and this is a, a store that I want to put together at some point where um, I get a really small storefront somewhere uh, in, a, in a highly dense urban area with um, like a subway nearby and it's a store that only sells like uh, Hario glass beakers and like different kinds of like uh, scientific beakers everything is glass and, and it's like a really tight and narrow space and every now and then the subway goes over the store and everything jingles and rings together in harmony and, and it, it's so tight that you really kind of have to slink through the aisles in a way that uh, that makes you feel uncomfortable. So you can keep an eye out for that. We're going to take a quick break. It's 12.03 right now, so we'll be back at 12.11.
Okay, we're back. Hello, hello everyone. I uh, hope you had a good break and considered the positive ways you can in inconvenience yourself on a day-to-day -day basis. Walking instead of driving or biking instead of driving is a good one, especially as this weather, uh, it's starting to thaw out. You know, I, the thing I love about living in the city is just seeing people like sitting on their porches again, even when it's like kind of too cold to do that. But like when it's like 43, where in the fall, nobody around here is sitting on their porch when it's 42. But in the spring, everyone is like, oh man, it's no 40s. Love that shit. Welcome back, y'all. Hello. You're going to have some snacks as we as we move through? Yeah, I might casually snack. Yeah, uh, one of the do. perks that, One of the perks of being a type 1 diabetic is that your life revolves around snacking constantly. And so <laughs> uh, my, my wife, Lynette, just brought me a plate full of delicious snacks. Just tested my blood sugar, doing really well. But yeah, Good. Oh, I have, I have the, my snacks. The stevia yeah. doesn't mess with that at all? No, not at all. That's like one of the perks is that it like doesn't affect your blood sugar at all. But because yeah, even cool. even aspartame can at some points can't it or some people like it makes them kind of weird it does a thing where it makes your body think that it's consuming sugar and so it uh, administers or like releases insulin uh but that doesn't affect me at all because i don't make any insulin oh so. okay okay yeah, so for, I, for the other type of diabetes that can be uh, a, a bigger problem yeah because then it can make you go hy uh, hypoglycemic which is like low blood sugar gotcha yeah well, yep. and we have a big audience of people who complain that we never eat brunch on on it's cam. Uh, so you you leading the 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 snack wave in the third hour, which maybe there we're onto something with that. Yeah. Huh? Well, apple and sharp cheese, y'all. <laughs> oh, and then killing the game too. Okay, <laughs> right. <laughs> just out the gate, we're going cheese and just wait for the apple. pretzel goldfish. Yeah, yeah. There we go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I'm Third, the third act of Travel AT brought to you by Pepperidge Farms. <laughs> Pepper Goldfish. Goldfish is that made is... by Pepperidge Farms? Yeah. I never put that together. Yeah. You know, it's weird how it's hiding right in plain on the front. Oh, there it is. Yeah. It's, Goldfish is such a modern brand. I mean, like, yeah. they, got the, they got the swirls and the gradients and the fish. Coming, for, like, coming out hot from the 90s. Yep. Yeah. But then you have, like, an old Not mill. Not changing a damn thing. Old yeah. mill road. I used to live on one of Creef Core Mill Road. We had a barn. Can we just talk about how goldfish are one of the best snack crackers there is, though? Is that you a know? is that controversial? No, I just I still don't know where I stand on the whole goldfish versus cheese it world. Oh, I goldfish, think goldfish, absolutely. Uh, I don't know. Cheeses really? are so salty. I mean, that's why it's so yeah. good, though. <laughs> <laughs> but pretzel, pretzel goldfish, goldfish. are so good. Yeah. Sounds crazy, but is it even a goldfish anymore? I mean, it's shaped like it a fish. Is, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, it do be looking like one. Yeah. Comes, comes out of that white bag. <laughs> it's still tasty, so I mean, who am I to say? I like um, Ritz yeah. myself. Oh, oh, oh! The dark, the dark night of the <laughs> Ritz, Ritz are good in that like brown plastic bag that they come in i love that they're shit. so buttery yeah oh they're delicious do they actually yeah. contain butter that's something i'll need to know. i don't know Honestly, they do maybe. they are very buttery yeah, very uh, buttery 50. regardless um if we don't get going we you know we might not, not might not ever start <laughs> i i i think <laughs> i love food so this is dangerous <laughs> Art Brunch, a show that is equal parts art, equal parts brunch. It really is. Yeah. I miss brunch. I really, really actually miss it. I just wanna... restaurants. I, that was I it took me a year to miss going out, and now I'm fully in the throes of missing it. I think up yeah. until this point I could have taken it or leaving it. But now I'm starting to feel like, oh, I would really love to go to Southwest Diner. I think yeah. that's that's just kind of what I want to do. Um yep. We'll get, we'll get there. I can't talk anymore about it because I'll start crying. So yeah, I'm like very, I'm very emotional about missing restaurants. <laughs> I worked in the food service industry for like ten years too, so it's like my second home is in a restaurant. And man, do I just miss it. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. I hear that full time. Oh, full scale. Um, some transition to some 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 built bridge to you know uh, the differences between sharing experiences in person and how we can create shared experiences across digital spaces 
Perfect. Uh, there we go. Yeah. 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 Seamless. Did it. Seamless. That's why we drink the same drink, you know? I, I think yeah. I think that like even if canned crucible changes as we know it, that the <laughs> it's such an inconvenient bit. It's like the most inconvenient thing that we do is like connect getting people to get the same beverage across states and like you you all are jake was able to drop it off but then sometimes we have people from out of this state or out of the country that then we have to be like well do they sell this there and it's like one it's that's the way that we can inconvenience my cat loves this paper bag right now inconvenience ourselves <laughs> the most on this show and and, it, and it, it's the thing that i think creates kind of like the foundation of our togetherness is mm -hmm. we're sharing sharing the same thing uh and and it and it does it, it i think it puts us in the same spot which absolutely kind of cool <laughs> yeah yeah it, it, it's it that felt intermediate like, <laughs> it is kind of it is a little bit it just <laughs> felt like hanging out with buds enjoying a soda though which is like a thing that i haven't done in a year and a half so or like yeah. a year you know so that was exciting yeah, yeah. And, and, but, but yeah, I mean, all of this is, is the bridge too long to try to get us into the conversation about this term intermediate object. And I wonder yeah. if, is, is that something that you coined or is it no, something that you're pulling not. from something? Okay. Cause yeah, I don't think it's like no nomenclature. I don't think it's like a very common usage. I've yeah. never heard it before talking with you. Uh, so Dick Higgins is part of the, he was part of the Fluxus movement in Black Mountain College. Okay. Uh, and Dick Higgins, uh, what's your cat's name again? He's beautiful. Virgil. Virgil. Oh. He's he's oh. really he's really thinning out. Such a sweet big. He's boy. still a bit chunky. <laughs> oh. But oh my goodness, he's lost <laughs> some serious weight. Oh, what's a lot? What's a stream with friends without a cat on screen? A hundred percent. Yeah. Oh. The cat chat has to enter. So important. <laughs> um, okay. So Dick Higgins was a part of like the Black Mountain School of Poets. He was part of the Fluxus movement. Uh, and he, while teaching at Black Mountain and doing other things, coined this term intermedia. And he was really interested in classical poetry. That's sort of what he formally studied. And then as he met performance artists and dancers and like rubbed elbows with like Merce Cunningham and John Cage and all these kind of people, he realized that writing a poem trapped it on a page and so he became really interested in like this sort of translating of a work on or off a page through this term intermedia so like this is a poem that's also a dance that's also a song or like this is a song that becomes a sculpture and then that sculpture in turn holds flowers that die so it's a performance that's sort of dick higgins thing um and this is obviously way pre-internet like 1950s 1960s one of the most famous things that higgins did was that he did a poetry reading at, it was like East Coast School. I can't remember where it was, but there's a picture of it. Uh, and he read a poem and he came in with this like huge, like a ream of paper. Like he was going to read this giant poem, right? And it was gonna, he was going to sit everyone down in this auditorium and they were going to have to sit through Higgins reading like a 400 page poem or whatever. And he uh, went to start reading the poem and he like picked up the first page and then he picked up the whole ream and just threw the ream into the room of people. And then he just sort of sat and watched them negotiate that. And then they realized that their job was to interact with the poem on the page rather than watch Higgins read the poem. And then it was like 400 broadsides of the same poem from what I understand. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I learned about this in graduate school and was like instantly captured absolutely subscribed to everything that he was talking about and was like this is what i've been doing since i was old enough to know how to mess up it was like i'm writing these songs but like these songs go along to like a, a narrative and i can't make a film so i'll make a concept album or whatever uh so as soon as i started reading about this intermedia term i was like that's amazing and i wanted one of the reasons why I used that term for cashed was because patient sounds very much felt like a record label. We're like, we do tapes or whatever. Uh, and then when we started trying to do books, there was like explanation that went into that. And so when I founded cashed, I was like, it's an intermedia uh, printer, like intermediate intermediate platform. We're going to sell and make CDs or maybe vinyl or I don't know, whatever down the road. Uh, we're going to do books. We're also able to, screen work 
So like I can work with filmmakers and we can do like a series of screenings of short films or we can do live streams of music or live streams of not music. And we can see what it looks like for a poet to be given a streaming platform for 45 minutes or whatever. And that was so exciting to me. Uh, and it's all absolutely just like pulled straight from Higgins sort of like he has a, a really amazing, I'll pull it up in a second and send you a link. Uh, he has this, he has a great Venn diagram, which like, I love a good Venn diagram uh, about what intermediate is. So let me pull that up. But And I'll yeah. vamp briefly and just say that diagrams serials seemingly were a really big deal in the last year or so uh -huh. in the design worlds. And I, I'm very curious about the future of the diagram, let alone the Venn diagram, because I think more more goes into that than just the diagram. But anyway, <laughs> my brief aside. Actually, while you're looking at it, I am going to grab something really quick that it has to do with what we're talking about. And so, Rick, your turn to vamp, I think. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I could take this opportunity to agree and that, you know, being able to um, use this this new... I, I, there's like a lot, of, a lot of real estate available in live broadcast. And the <laughs> I think the ability for us to do that it's still kind of like just out of reach of the norm like the the average person but it's really it's not i think that a show like this and, and kind of like what we're thinking about takes um some technical prowess that the the average bear doesn't quite have um but like everybody has access to live now everybody has access to live with instagram and with facebook and we're you know viewing viewing live media regularly but i think you know it, it took me i don't know whatever 40 100 200 hours to actually figure out how i wanted to use software and you know how to begin to craft a live show and then like a live platform but um being able to give that those tools to um, people who are just on the cusp of that is a really big part of the travel agency because when you can elevate somebody into the space and kind of take care of them, then they're free to just like run wild and not have to worry about investing the the 200 hours into something that they might not actually like at the end of the day, whereas I knew I would. So I've got your, um, okay, I've got this up here. Let me see if I can. I think about it this way too, Rick, like George Martin, like the Abbey Road, engineer who recorded all the Beatles music, you know, mm. like it took him 200, 400 hours to figure out how to run those tape machines in a way that uh, made the Beatles sound. Mm. And so like, I think that uh, just because the technology is accessible doesn't necessarily mean that it's master, like masterable quickly. Yeah. Uh, and I think the same way about Instagram live, like we all have those friends who go on Instagram live and uh it's a, it's awkward or uncomfortable. Like uh, the mastery isn't always just in operating the technology. It's also in how you interact with it. And so, uh, yeah, I absolutely think uh, that learning how to stream or how to maintain or build these digital spaces for people to interact within uh, is the thing that we're all learning how to do. And so like when I saw this intermediate chart, it floored me because it was like, oh, this is like what everyone is doing on streaming networks that mm. i find most interesting uh and i also think like you could put a bubble in there that's like gaming like when mm -hmm. you guys do minecraft that's an intermediate performance because it's a happening and it's like uh conceptual in some ways i don't know so when i saw this venn diagram that dick higgins made for what intermedia is or isn't uh i see this like you know male art uh happenings action music graphic music notations objects like all of this stuff i'm like oh this is what i want to do with my label and then the sexiest part to me was the three bubbles with question marks mm, and i, I was like blowing my mind <laughs> yeah and that's when i was like okay like this uh i think when we come up whether it's like a artistic concept or branding concept uh you don't want x quotients like you don't want unknown values that's scary it's a risk uh, but for Higgins, that was central to what this was about was sort of like, I'm going to invite those X qualities into this so that, uh, we can always add more to this chart as it grows and changes. That's really, really exciting to me. And so when I sort of saw this intermediate term, I pocketed it very hard and was like, oh, this is like what I'm going to do down the road. This is what I've been doing. I'm going to keep it up. Absolutely. 
Yeah. Yeah. In, um, the, in the uh, a quick thing, and then um, so when I was looking up intermedia, uh, this <laughs> this term came up um, that I think is fitting for some of our conversations today, which was intermedium, and it's like a particular type of bone in the wrist. And uh, I think I don't know if humans have it, but it was it was in like some arthropod that has like Ooh. this 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 bone, and I'm not sure what it does. But <laughs> um, but like I I used to be a massage therapist, and I'm thinking about like all of these carpals and all of like the ways that your wrist works, but kind of like the thing central to the manipulation, and and having this kind of like intermedia as well of like this thing kind of at the core that is helping like the meticulations and the materialization materialization of the ideas as kind of uh, just a, an interesting bridge that that i found last night in my research oh totally and i think like uh articulation is a huge part of it like uh being able to point at this bubble and then this bubble and then this bubble mm -hmm. uh which like uh is also what this sweatshirt is totally about is saying like uh, this is a creative process, but it's also all of this other stuff. And then also it just back around. Like, I, uh, I also think good poetry does that. Like you start at the top of a page. We have a pretty rigid understanding of how to read a poem. But I think a good poem is a series of arrows that points you from one thing to another. It's like the transitive property, like A equals B equals C. Uh, and then when you get to that final C, you look how A and C compare and you're like, holy shit. Uh, you know? Uh, my love is a red, red rose. Like, wow, uh, that's such a corny example, but uh, <laughs> it's beautiful. But it's the one. I mean, it's though, right? the one, right? You, yeah, and you and can't so, get to that the first time you hear it. Yeah, it, <laughs> and I think like uh, I don't know. I mean, I studied poetry, and so that was like my undergrad degree was in classical modernist American poetry, mm -hmm. and I loved it. But I never saw poetry and ambient music overlapping was like am i gonna do like spoken word over guitar drone that feels corny like i don't know so it was one of those things where i never felt like those worlds were allowed to overlap in the same way and then on this chart I'm like oh i'm doing everything that's in those question marks and that feels good and so that's where it let me have over like ownership over not knowing what the hell i was doing and it was really nice that's good well, very yeah. briefly, I, I I feel like this kind of sums up a lot of what you're saying specifically about like poetry existing in another space, and that is a concept of like X existing in Y. It's like your book Prompt that you oh, yeah. uh -huh. on Cached Media, yeah. I think is fantastic. And I, I can maybe try my hand at doing it so you don't have to <laughs> tell everything, but it's an open source sketchbook broadcast project. Download audio to accompany your activities with included download code. So there's like this here to draw in and there's like instructions like prompts more accurately and then you complete your sketchbook with drawing writing and collage and then follow or ignore the prompt and then scan the images and send them back to you which is like this is poetry in motion literally and figuratively and then also has the sonic experience of here's intentional music with this but like you're creating the poetry it's almost like creating a beat and being, okay, now you rap over this part. This it's is a, for you. It's you a know. collaboration for sure. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, Studio Space in the chat says, love that. Studio Space also runs a collaborative art project here on Twitch. Um, oh, cool. So, Thank so you, Studio Space. We got all the homies, all the homies all the folks here. in the shop. Um, yeah. I have not received many scans back of Prompt, and I am so mystified. <laughs> hmm. uh, they just went out into the world and then no one drew in the journals or sent them back. And that's great with me. That's actually almost better. My plan was to put the, all of those scans together and then broadcast them on Twitch uh, with the music playing in the background. And this wow. is one of those question mark uh, things where it was like, I didn't get, I only got two people's scans back. And so mm -hmm. it was like, I can't really just like run the two people's scans because I made 20 of those or something and they're all out. And, uh, I also am a collector of sketchbooks that I never fill in. So I also wonder how many people got them and then never filled them in uh, or wrote in them or whatever. Which kind of is like the true manifestation of a proper sketchbook. Like yep. myself here, literally airing myself out here live that I haven't touched this thing since I got it. And I think that's also something that's powerful though, that it it is a collector's item in yes. its silence too is yes. interesting. Yeah, and, 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 and there's no bit of me owning this that doesn't feel like I 
possess something like powerful and deeply like like it has such value to me that I'm almost like scared to touch it. Mm. And and I, I almost just want people to look at it as like an art object itself and being like, I, hate I don't even that. need to fill this out. To... <laughs> I hate that. He's drawing a sketchbook. <laughs> I know. He's <laughs> drawing it, Jake. That's what it's made that's for. The, that's like the but... problem with making a sketchbook. That's like the fundamental space that you're, you're rocking with. Because if you make it too cheap and shitty, who's going to yeah. buy that sketchbook? And what are they going to do with it? But if you make it too nice... Like and I, I'm it always is. in that balance with my own sketchbooks of it's like so nice. I have to find these things that fit a space that allows me to be creative. Like without yeah. without yeah. like my really good depth like I looked at sketchbooks last night for like an hour and didn't find one that I would actually work in. And yep. There's like a very specific book that I know that I can work in. So then so then yeah, you get you get to this point. I just live in these because I know that I can live in these, yeah, the Strathmore yeah. green cover, and I have everything in this sketchbook. I take notes while I'm teaching in these. Uh, I doodle in them during staff meetings. Uh, I draw jazz characters. It's just like uh, I know that this book is sacred to me, and I know that I would also have used a sketchbook like the one that Jake pulled out, the prompt sketchbook. So mm -hmm. I was like, I don't know. Uh, you have to, you have to know that thing about yourself. And I also yeah. was like is making sketchbooks a huge risk because <laughs> am I going to send these to people and they're going to be like, Oh, I shouldn't use it. But I had a teacher in art school who like, like literally in a kind way screamed at me because I bought materials to work with. and was afraid to crack the seal on this like expensive paint. And he was like, use the fucking paint. And I was like, yeah. ah. <laughs> and he was like, like, do I need to like open it for you and grab your hand and just like spill some so you have to use it? And I was like, no, I use the paint. Okay. <laughs> and now it's like, uh, I, it changed. Yeah. It's a, it's just as much a waste of money to buy a thing and not use it when it has 100%. a function. It is to just uh, use it in the first place and mm -hmm. mess it up. Use I don't it. know. That's the, yeah, use the paint. The tagline. Use yeah. the paint. Use the sketchbook, Jake. <laughs> and then we'll all get yeah. there again at, at the end of our master cycle, where yeah. where then it's then it's just like we finally have the platform to be like it was the material the whole time, and it was the fucking tree the yep. whole time, and right. I'm gonna use my the last dying breath to let you know it was the fucking the patch of grass the whole time. <laughs> but you just yep. didn't believe me yeah. until I'm dying. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Jake, I also have no interest in publicly Twitch shaming you on your birthday saying you didn't fill out your sketchbook. That's hey, not you know what? But I also want my teachers to yell at me and to say, use the damn paint. And even better, honestly, the lesson that I've learned to be aired out publicly on my birthday is the time, you know? Like, let's get the shirt dirty at, at yeah. the paintball party. You know, yeah. let's do this. <laughs> what what let's a little go. shithead, Cody. <laughs> I hope he's watching. Yeah, 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 I hope so too. I hope that he's watching because that means that I don't. I don't want to go into it. Um, it's a whole can of worms. <laughs> it it's, I think it's incredible to you know. I, I I love the meta of this show, and I love this like streamers hanging with streamers, streaming about being streamers with streamers in the chat is like yeah. is like a really good kind of like coming of age moment for this because. The show, our show, I think like Jake puts it best by stealing what Virgil Abloh talks about is, is trying to <laughs> inhabit the space in between tourist and purist and how we huh. can kind of exist in the space that I think that everything that we talked about today was accessible and approachable. That's my word. So you, you use the other words, but my word for my art is like making my paintings approachable or like making mm -hmm. the travel agency approachable is, is kind of like my own personal take on this idea of like, how do you bring people into the ecosystem? And then how do you support individuals inside of that ecosystem? Because if, if we can do that and make a place that kind of like feels comfy for people, then, right. then like the power of God is in our hands. And, and that's, <laughs> yeah. that's like a fun way to get It's there. also in their hands. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's in their hands too when you do that. And I think that that's like the most exciting thing is when, like, I always talk about it too, is like street level access. Like, I think there's so much art that you look at where if you don't have an art, like an MFA and you aren't ready to like unpack a historical background, you have no access to it. And so you sit and look at a painting on a wall and are like, like, this means not much to me. Like, mm -hmm. uh, and I think, 
I love artwork like that, <laughs> but I have had the privilege of going to art school, but I see that kind of artwork as being inhospitable. And mm -hmm. so, yeah, like what the travel agency is doing too, is like this idea of accessibility, uh, like letting people in through street level access, like making sure everyone can get into the space. I also think that's super radical. It's a very radical act. Yeah, I mean, we try to be radical. You yeah, know, Mahalo, Shaka, bro. bro. Yeah, we try to just hang <laughs> loose around here, here, bro. Right yeah, it's really you really diffused my whole like serious angle there. Mahalo means funny. family. Yeah, it does. That's, true. <laughs> That's Ohana. Okay. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Ohana. Right. What does Mahalo mean? I think I don't know. I'm I I did ruin the moment, and I apologize. No, so I, I, I I'm. <laughs> We just fell down the stairs together. <laughs> we did. It was fun. It was. It hurt, but it was fun. I want to. Um, you. You got yeah. something last. Last to say, and then we can head over to those ten questions. Uh, to me, moi. You, yeah. You. You had something yeah. to say. Well, I just. Okay. First of all, that is so meaningful, and I. I feel weird like accepting that love because this is. Like, I feel like this is a group thing. So Rick, get in the on, oh, yeah, on yeah. the love train too, but like I have felt so, like. I know. I feel like Rick has really helped me be in this space. And then while while watching you, Matt, get on Cashed and do your version of it and watching everyone doing these very like cousins of each other sort of thing. Like no one's doing exactly the same thing. Mm -hmm. I don't feel like there's any bad blood, you know, like everyone's like feeling this mutual love, but everyone has their own little thing, you know? And I think that it's, it's that embrace of the hospitality of art that it's like, yeah, it's approachable, but there's something so much deeper. Yeah, that, like, I don't think we've cracked it, and that to me is like my like. I think the the three question marks, you know, one of those is just like streaming, mm -hmm. like not even gaining, just like streaming. streaming. The ability to just like turn on a live cannon, put yourself in front of it, and someone is seeing you, and on like a maybe five to seven second delay, mm -hmm. you know, and yeah. that like everything you're doing, they see it, and you can interact with those people in this space. And I also and think they being respond. At home, yeah, and they respond, and frankly, like being able to do it from home or on a bus or at a you know a cafe, hopefully someday, whatever you know that you're also like closely in a very comfortable personal space yep. while very much being in a public space. Like I think there's like a animalistic monkey in you that's just like I don't know what the hell's happening. I don't get this. You know, it's like yeah. being in an airplane looking down, and being like this shouldn't be happening. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Uh -huh. And I I just I'm so. So excited to see not only the future of this medium in general, but like specifically where you you folks are going and, and our friends, maybe like Studio Space and whoever else. Um, I just I think that this is maybe not the future, but certainly the near future, if nothing else. Yeah, you know, Boogie of, Nights of and and Nico and and just like having a, a group of friends. Like there are three people that that stream like we stream in St. Louis, and I I'm one of them, and I know the other two. And it's like a little yeah. family. So when Jake sent me Cash Media, I was like, another person streams something that's like kind of cool. It's like, <laughs> how weird is that? How weird is and that? And there's there's also uh, Flatlands Gallery and Flatlands TV. I don't know if you've watched them at all. And then they did a, uh, they did a really cool series with like films. Uh, Kurt Miller is the guy who's doing that. Uh, and I think they kind of pumped the brakes a little bit because they were going really hard during like the first wave of COVID. But mm -hmm. I do like to think like um, there's two things. Uh, Jake was talking about how it's like not maybe not the wave of the future, but where it's where we're at right now. I always think about it as like lily pads. Like we're always jumping from lily pad to lily pad to get across something. Absolutely. And we are on this lily pad right now. And I think uh, we are still figuring out how big or small the lily pad is. And that's yeah. a really exciting place to be in. Uh, I also think that's a great visual metaphor for the intermedia chart. It's yeah. like a, a <laughs> collection of lily pads that we are yeah. like as artists in an, in a time when we have so many resources accessible to us and we can make a feature length film on our iPhone uh, and put it on YouTube and reach an enormous audience. Like yeah. we're all negotiating uh, how to deal. And I, uh, there's a lot of like Eurocentric Western American bias in what I was just saying, because like not everybody has access to that. Yes. Like mm -hmm. uh, it's very much like a first world privilege to be able to talk about like how everyone can make a movie on their iPhone. But uh, I also, I had a, a graduate school teacher. Her name was Janet Desaulier. And Janet Desaulier said this thing to me one day when I was talking about my practice. And she said, uh, it's as lonely ahead of the curve as it is behind the curve. And 
that hits me every day when I'm making work uh, because I think there is a time where you're working on something and it feels like you're before the crest of the wave and uh, you're making this thing that you're really excited about and you're, it can be a little frustrating that no one else is on that wave with you. Uh, and then simultaneously you make that thing and then everyone gets on that wave and then the wave has already passed you and you see all these people riding this wave that you were on before them. And so I think that like as artists, who are negotiating, dealing with media changing constantly, in this case, like streaming, access to streaming technology. Like we are uh, however much ahead of the curve as we are also soon to be behind the curve. And like, I think about it this way, like all of these gamers are like pissed at the art kids who are getting on and streaming <laughs> on Twitch because we're taking over their platform. We're and ruining I think the that, culture. <laughs> yeah, we're ruining the culture. And like that culture is totally yeah. valid. Just and so, just chatting completely ruined Twitch. As I mean, yeah. for, for, uh, like Justin TV versus just chatting. You know, it, it's like on Twitch. It's like just chatting has 350k concurrent viewers in it at all times, which is like yep. always the highest rated, like above Fortnite uh, or Travis Scott's Fortnite thing, which was like a music thing. Was yeah. like did crazy numbers, and AOC did 300k on her stream. Yeah, <laughs> that's when yep. when Drake went on to Ninja's Fortnite stream. That was the that was the end. You know, it was rinsed. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah. Thanks a lot, Drake. <laughs> Thanks, Drake. Uh, so I think that I'm always thinking about. I guess I'm not. I'm trying not to make thinking about where I am on the wave, but that's where I retcon. Mm. Where I make something and then I'm like, where is this in that pattern of being ahead or behind the wave? And like, how can I make it more hospitable for someone in both positions? Yeah. yeah. Someone who's like deep and already has passed this thing. How can I make this uh, tactile or interesting to them? And similarly, like, how can I make this interesting to someone who's never, who's never listened to a single ambient song? First time like, on the board. I... Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so uh, I don't know. I'm always thinking about, and I think that's why Twitch was so appealing to me. It was, it was sort of this, like, I'd always wanted to be in television or broadcasting in some way, and it was always inaccessible. Yeah. And then all of a sudden I was like, oh, I can screen my friends' my friend's films on Twitch. And I don't also have to be a part of YouTube culture, which is, like, a whole other thing. It is. And so that was really exciting to me. Yeah. Absolutely. And then when I saw you guys, I was like, they get it. <laughs> <laughs> they get it. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. I have to say, I, I I feel us moving to the ten questions as we're bumping up against time. But I, I just want to ask one last question, Matt. How did it feel to only how to only say the word ambient twice in three hours? <laughs> like so good. <laughs> did it feel really good? <laughs> yeah. Did, like, were in, you in, keeping tally? Like... <laughs> he was. It's yeah. on his pad. Yeah. Here we go. Oh, it's on a right. steno. Yeah. <laughs> uh. Yeah, it's it like, felt great. It's gonna come up, but we haven't really. And I like, I love it. I think that's good. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's only a part of the that I cultivate on social media. Uh, yeah. That's also absolutely a character. Uh huh. Yeah. Oh, and, and so we, my God, we didn't even get into just... your memes today. Yeah, yeah, we got a whole round of uh, yeah. Um, well, well, let's get into our own memes here. I'm glad we could provide a space <laughs> for you, where at least somebody, you, you know, like you, you know, you can. You can take a break and then you can just go back and hit the memes really hard later today if you're feeling kind of empty from that. And uh, we'll support you over there too. We'll give you some some double taps. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> we always do. I always do. Yeah. For sure. <laughs> yeah. um, 10 questions of prowess. How about that? How oh, do you like that? Of, of prowess. I like that idea. Uh, um, <laughs> you want to take the first one? Sure. Do you mind? Let's make Matt big again, I think. Just oh, before sorry. We move yeah, on. Thank I think you. it'll be good. Um, okay, Matt, what is one simple thing you're trying to get good at? Hmm. Official noob wise. Hello. Hello. Welcome to the chat. We're in our final segment here, the show with Matt Sage, the 10 questions of prowess. We asked, we went deep down the rabbit hole and now we are asking him some questions that reveal some, uh, a mixed bag of elements of his personality. <laughs> One simple thing that I want to get good at. Yeah. Or one simple thing you are trying, Try, yeah, trying, trying to, to get, get good, good at. at. Doing the dishes. Mm. I don't think it's necessary. I think it's not so much a level of skill. It's just commitment. Like you I, I, 
was a dishwasher for like four years at a restaurant uh -huh. because I was never given like much room to move up. And so then once I got out of the dishwashing position, I was basically like, I'm never washing dishes again. And I do 90% of the cooking in our house, uh, which leaves my partner and wife Lynette to do most of the dishes. And I always feel horrible about it, but I also hate doing the dishes because I did it for so long. So it's you a thing that I wish, I think, I wish that I was more able. It's so simple. You scrub plates off and make them clean to eat off of, but it is like a giant undertaking for me to do the dishes <laughs> and you're yeah. trying you're trying to get good at I, it you... <laughs> some, that is, sometimes that mm -hmm. yeah sometimes yeah. yeah that's a valid yeah. pursuit um i'll take the second one too i like it when we do doubles like that mm. uh what is your favorite type of gum Ooh. i really like uh it's not as popular anymore i don't think but it was the gum with crystals in it that sort of like was crackly. Uh, it was like, dent I don't know if it was dentine or extra polar ice or something. It had like extra flavor crystals inside of it or something. I, I really like dentine. I'm yeah. Sure. I really yeah. liked, I really liked some of that gum. Uh, I also was like, uh, I was a kid. I loved a good giant piece of bubblicious. Hell yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Does a flavor come to mind? Uh, the most nightmare of them all was the cotton candy flavor, which I loved, but it was so gross. Oh, so I don't. Bad. I think I would probably vomit if I tried to eat a piece of delicious <laughs> cotton candy gum today. But definitely, yeah. That's... But when I was a kid, that was the good stuff. But yeah, I like a good. I don't know. I feel like green gum, like spearmint gum, uh, tastes real plasticky after a while. I like a good blue, a blue, like a blue, a blue mint gum is what I'm into. Blue gum for sure. Yeah, yeah, blue gum's where it's at. Blue gum. Absolutely. Or like silver blue. You know how silver blue is like a brand of gum now? If I'm going to go for a gum on a shelf, it's always going to be in a silver blue package. Yeah, like uh, like five gum. Yep, five gum. Yep. Yep. In a second with that one. <laughs> five gum's my absolute favorite gum brand. Yeah. Uh, I was really leaning into it for a while, trying to get like a five gum sponsorship. Uh because I could make some, I I know what it feels like to chew five gum, and <laughs> <laughs> I also know how to like stimulate your senses. And uh, we'll get into this in a, in a, in a second here, but I I think that like if I could just be in charge of whatever their budget was for making five gum ads, the shit that I would have cooked up, dude, would have like both sold so much gum and horrified people about yeah. like the process of what it what it meant to chew five gum uh <laughs> matt have you ever successfully completed a game of monopoly sorry i'm snacking um <laughs> you yeah, thought i was I gonna have... go on a tire on, on a longer tirade there i can see yeah. why you think that like, I, got a snack yeah, I was like oh rick's firing up i got to, <laughs> this I'm, is I'm snack, an apple snack and cheese. chat yeah um <laughs> uh, okay yes i have completed a game of monopoly I've also not completed many games of Monopoly, both through Rage Quits and through Sheer Boredom. Definitely. Yeah, that's yeah. vibes. Yeah. Um, Monopoly was a big part of my family. Official new boys in the chat says, oh man, I wish not doing the dishes was the biggest of my problems. Yeah, <laughs> it's... <laughs> It's, I mean, it's not that we I'm, all <laughs> I'm about to be a dad, which is like a nuanced quite answer to that question. Like, what's a, something simple you want to be better at? Like, I want to be a really good dad, but that's not simple. So, uh, like, I had to like think the ultimate. Task. Yeah. And so I was thinking, like, what's simple that I wish I were better at? And like one of the most simple things is how there's always dirty dishes in my sink. It, it's and a, I wish I was better at doing it. It's that. a foundational skill. I think yep. I think that uh, putting a solid foundation in the sink and the sink and the dish rack game, I, you know, is it, like it's a really good jumping off point for success in other places in your life. Not to put too much pressure on it because then we start to fail again. But that's yep, yep. that's what I've noticed in, in my own experience. There's something so pure about waking up on a weekday morning and there is not a single dirty dish in your sink that like makes your whole day better. Uh, and that's the thing that I, like we all deserve to feel every day. But I don't want to do the dishes after 6 p.m. Mm. And nor should you. I want to sit down and watch like an hour or two hours of like mind numbing programming with my wife on our couch, drink a few LaCroix, eat some snacks, go to sleep. I don't want to wash plates. As, as a guy on the other side of the plate, I just <laughs> want to let you know it's nice over here. 
it's it it's was. nice and it's worth it. You just do them after, <laughs> just do the dishes after you eat, and it changes it changes the whole it changes the whole game. But I know how hard it is to hear that and how much of an asshole I sound like because <laughs> I. I that's that's you how did. I felt about me, but <laughs> you did. It's true. I just want to add, I I'm officially on the other side of the dish, and I just want to let wound. you know it's nice over there. <laughs> Here's my wound, and it's full of salt from you. Yeah, so thank wow, you, Rick. What you Thanks, done. Rick. <laughs> uh, if you couldn't be an artist, a musician, or a teacher, um, any of the things that you're doing right now, official new wise. Thanks for the follow. I don't know why our alerts are broken. But thanks for the follow. I appreciate it. Thanks, official new boys. Thank you, official new boys. Um, I gotta fix those damn alerts. Uh, I don't know how they would have broken. Other than being like an artist, musician, you know, a label manager, any of the jobs that you have right now that you love, what would be your dream job with with no like physical or emotional limits? I'd be a cook. I would run a kitchen probably. Mm. Yeah, I love to cook. I love the kitchen space. Uh. It's also like grueling and arduous. So like all of that stuff aside, uh, I love to cook and I love food. Hmm. So I'd absolutely without a doubt be a cook or work in a kitchen. Hmm. That's yep. solid. Yep. Um, Matt, what was your favorite cartoon growing up? Oof, that's a hard one. I was like a serious, I mean, I think we all were serious cartoon consumers. Some still are. Yeah, I mm, I was an early adopter of Pokemon, and I remember when they were showing it at 6 a.m. on Fox on weekdays before yeah. it was, like, really cool. And my parents were baffled that I was waking up at 6 a.m. to watch a Japanese cartoon on Fox. Yep. And so I think – and it became so formative to me. And the sound design on Pokemon is really good, and, uh, like, I don't know. Uh, it also was a thing where it felt like none of my friends were as into it, so it felt like mm. special and sort of secretive. Uh, I love Pokemon. Also, I was huge on Dragon Ball Z. Mm. Uh, but it's my lane right there. DBZ. Oh yeah. Yeah. I I I don't know, but I feel like that that lacks. I watched all sorts of cartoons. I really liked Looney Tunes when I was a kid, even though yeah, like totally. it's basic. But I don't know. No, it's not basic. That shit was yeah. that fire. Some of yeah. that shit was crazy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I used the word, but but some of that stuff was like it, it was definitely my first uh, foray with absurdism. Yep. Like, and um, we, I think that the uh, the absurdity in in cartoons, especially in the period in our generation was formative and special and, and unique and it's probably still there i don't know how much it was there prior to our generation it probably was always there people were always probably just getting high and making cartoons for kids <laughs> or just being like in some way just like a little <laughs> off or they they didn't have like the guidance of the family that they needed when they were growing up and they grew up to make cartoons and they're just trying to like give these kids something <laughs> to go? hold on to. I, I just think that that's accurate. I don't think that no, I mean, there, there's any Mel like Blank. yeah. No, he he needed some help, so he he turned to cartoons for sure. I th also, like I think back about shows like Rocco's Modern Life. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. That stuff was twisted. Ren and Stimpy. Twisted. Yeah, Ren and Next Stimpy. Level. Yeah, uh, all that kind of stuff, and even like Animaniacs. Like if oh, you go Animaniacs. back and watch. Yeah, there's a lot of crazy stuff in Animaniacs, and I use the word now too. But well, yeah, there's a lot of stuff. We don't mean uh, it that way. I gave everybody yeah. a complex. <laughs> it's wild. No, it's it's it's, it's a wild, wild space. Wild. In those places. We'll use the yes. word wild. I I I'm actually starting to wonder if wild is is also like going to be a totally... word that I look back on and think is 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 in the same vein as being inappropriate, such as crazy. Uh, it's colonialist. Yeah. Oh, true. But then, like, okay, uh, this. We can't get this. <laughs> I have a lot of feelings about cancel culture, but well, that's not worth it. <laughs> oh, perfect. Next question, Matt. What do you think about cancel? <laughs> <laughs> actually, this uh, actually kind of has to do it with it in a good way. Um, who is an artist you hate to love? Cy Twombly. Yeah. Ooh. He's like one of my all-time favorite artists, but I hate trying to explain why his work is so good. Yeah. We're actually we're actually retiring this question after today. Uh, another okay. thing that we're retiring, and I think that that's a really good answer to it. 
Um, our guest last week said Salvador Dali, which yep. I think is a solid answer. But for the if you know you know crowd, Cy Twombly is is a a, a very Scribble. good answer. <laughs> Scribble painting master. Uh-huh. Uh huh. Unparalleled scribbler. Yeah. Sculpture is made of trash. Beautiful. I hate trying to explain why his work moves me so much. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but it's, but, but, I've, but you I'm looking at his scribbles. But you love the artist. You hate it. I love. Art. Yeah, I love Cy Twombly, and I hate having to explain why I think <laughs> he's so good. But you don't hate to love him, though, necessarily. Yeah, I do, because I love him, and I hate how much I love him. <laughs> yeah. Okay. It's there. Yeah. I love that. What? Like, he has this museum, the Menil Collection, has a Cy Twombly Galleria that's just full of just Cy Twombly work. I have never been more moved by a single art experience. There's a few, and that's very high on the list of walking through the Cy Twombly Galleria and then walking out and realizing that I I was just moved to tears by scribbles on a wall. I was like, that sucks. (laughs) It was so moving, and it was scribbles. And I can't... (laughs) It's, like, worse than Rothko, because Rothko's at least, like, Oh, it's got the air. Field. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and he has like a chapel. Uh-huh. But I, I looked at scribbles on a wall and sculptures made out of trash covered in white plaster. And I was like, those sculptures are something <laughs> else. Sobbing in the it's corner. So beautiful. Yeah. I hate how much I love it and how much I have to like justify. Like my parents came to Chicago. My parents are not super hyper art folks at all. They're like first or second generation off the farm in Nebraska people. And they're amazing people. And I love them dearly. And they came to Chicago and I was showing them around the art Institute when I was going to school at SAIC. And I showed them the Cy Twombly paintings and the look of just like, like <laughs> emptiness. It was like, and they're very, like my mom is like an intellectual person who likes to engage with ideas. And she was so turned off. Mm-hmm. And that's when I was like, oh, no, art school is ruining me. Like, I knew. Yeah. I knew something was wrong. What have you done? Yeah, you got the sickness. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's how I feel about Richard Tuttle in, in particular. Yeah. Like, mm-hmm. there are some times where, uh, like, Richard, Richard Tuttle did uh, install of his wire pieces here at the Pulitzer um, because Emily asked him personally to redo it, and he hadn't done it since, like, the 80s. Whoa. And, like... I, that room is just like it's not even a real room of art because you can't even see them until you're like up on them and they're just a little piece of wire and a little piece of pencil mark on the wall and i mean it's just like bro you fucked that up like <laughs> <laughs> gandry, a... gandry in the chat says saic is ruining all of us <laughs> yeah it's true oh that's gianni what's up gianni yeah he's oh being... g andre g andre yeah, andre, andre. Maybe? uh yeah i'll just he call you g also... Yeah, he's also for sure being ruined. Uh, it's fine, Gianni. Uh, I want to add one more artist to that list too, and we don't have to spend a lot of time with this. But I love to hate Matthew Barney. Hmm. We don't have to spend a lot of time with that if you want. But I'm actually not familiar. So oh, that's I'm, Bjork's. Like, I know that name. Bjork's ex-husband. He did the Cremaster Cycle and Drawing Restraint Nine. Uh, like right. the first piece of conceptual work where I realized that artists had to spend. 600 pages explaining a short film and i was like this is beautiful this guy sucks <laughs> uh yeah okay. here's artnet article just really briefly it says kanye west calls matthew barney to jesus or compares matthew barney to jesus so that's all you need to know <laughs> uh he's had an he's had an inexplicable effect on music video culture in rap in the rap community like that's everything what i was remembering everything that like beyonce has been doing uh is obviously Beyonce and she deserves every ounce of credit that she's mm-hmm. come up with, but she is definitely uh, and heartily and profoundly borrowing from Matthew Barney and subverting his visual aesthetic to create beautiful artwork. Yeah. Wow. I mean, it, it, that makes really clear why Lil Uzi got a $26 million diamond implanted in his head. Yep. I hope yeah, it works him. for him too. Me too. I hope he makes it past 27. We'll see where oh. that goes. Oh. That, that's, that's the whole thing. That's why you got it. No, the 27 club for real. Yeah. Um. All right. Well, <laughs> who's, well, up, that note. who's up? <laughs> uh, I think I got two. It's your turn. While driving, are you the giver or the receiver of the finger? Uh, I actually, when someone is uh, rude in traffic to me, I usually throw up a peace sign. Okay. Because That's I think that to know. I, I, <laughs> It's a very twee. Okay, it's very it. it's a very twee answer, but it's true. You're like, like between, between the lines. Traffic, <laughs> uh, I mean, I think it's actually more powerful than when someone does something rude to you in traffic, and you're like, 
Oh, uh, 100%. So it really can... gets under their skin. So I think it's worse than the finger. That was a very, like, kawaii pose right there. It was. <laughs> That's how I do it, though. Like, <laughs> someone cuts me off in traffic, and I see them look in their mirror. That I'm was, like, like, 08 MySpace. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's the vibe that I throw out my window when someone does something rude to me in traffic. I used to do okay. a thumbs up, like, but like the thumbs really, up is like, also good. Gestured thumbs up, it's just like, yeah, I yeah. Think that that's also a really good move. I like the thumbs up too. I like to flash thumbs up at people when they're not expecting it because they almost always give them give it back. <laughs> like I do it to cashiers a lot, because uh, they're already kind of like working with their hands, and then if you give them a thumbs up, you'll see it just oh, they just can't, they can't <laughs> like. They don't even know they're doing it, but it's just oh, it comes out of them. Drop whatever they're. <laughs> oh, that's great. What's happening? I feel like that that appeals to the same impulse in me to make faces at children when they're looking at me and their parents don't know they're looking at me. This is a thing that I do all the time, and I and I like know I need to be better about not doing that. But like, if a child in public is looking at me, yeah. I will make a face at that kid, and then that kid will be like, "Mom." And then I'm like pushing my cart away or whatever. Yeah. But those are the some of the brightest points of light in my life every day is well, when that, a child is looking at me and I get to make a face. That's like making a cartoon. You're a cartoonist at that point. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. <laughs> Without all of the hard work and dedication, you're just Absolutely. preying on children. Yep. Uh, that, hold on. Can we can we strike that preying on children part from the record? <laughs> can you edit that out? Because that's not. <laughs> uh, okay. yeah. Trying to become a dad out. <laughs> I don't. I, I, well, you know, take it as you will. Yeah. <laughs> um, what are your thoughts on Crocs? Is the eighth uh, question. I don't own any Crocs, but I have the rubber Birkenstocks, the Birkin Crocs, mm -hmm. uh, and I wear those almost every day. I think Crocs are fantastic. I Crocs are from 30 minutes outside of my hometown. I love Crocs. Okay. Oh. Cool. Crocs Shout founded out. in Boulder, Colorado. I am from Fort Collins, which is like 35 minutes away. Uh, also, did you know that you can eat Crocs? Uh, are we talking? They are made out of they're made out of corn. Oh. And so you could boil a Croc and eat a Croc if you want. That might be a show for Cash Media. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Kind of you guys want to do a crossover? Vibe, maybe. Real <laughs> art for real people. Real Crocs for real people. <laughs> real art for real people is just me cutting up a Croc with a knife and fork and eating it. Dipping it in mayonnaise. Vegan yeah. man vegan and mayonnaise. Are they vegan? Yeah, they are. Yeah. Alright, Jake. Okay. Rick, let's let's tag team this. I'll do nine, you do ten. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, Matt, describe your meditation practice or similar way of relaxing slash connecting. Mowing the lawn. Shoveling snow. Cover that one good, I think. That's yeah. Those are my answers. Mowing the lawn, shoveling snow. And, and also, that's why uh, you unlocked the baby achievement. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Sure. Uh, also, playing the playing the drums along to music I love. Mm. Those are three ways that I exit my body in a really nice way. It's a very like active meditation. I yeah, think. I'm. I am. There's like the in my body, so I have to move in order to think. I get into these videos, video tangents on YouTube of the, I forget his name and I feel bad, but the drummer for Snarky Puppy does these really nicely produced drumio videos where he like listens to any song that he's never heard before and then like listens to it one time and then like plays it perfectly. Oh, cool. And it's so, it's so cool to watch him work. And I'm like, I've never been the music guy. And so I, I just live so vicariously through the way this guy can just like move his body. That sounds and fun. Boop, 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 boop it up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll send you a link. Uh, there's all this science that uh, points to how people who play the drums' brains work completely differently than non drummers, though. Mm -hmm. uh, we have like spatio reasoning that we, I was a kid taking yes, I was like, and everyone in my class was like, make him go away, which actually led to test anxiety. Like, I have to move in order to think. You'll notice I've been like wildly gesticulating this whole time. It's uh, it's a part of my drum brain, yeah. It's Which I think mowing the lawn, shoveling snow, that's mm -hmm. all part of it too. Yeah, very good. Okay, yeah. and the final question that we have for you here today is: What is the most memorable response you've received about your work? Oof. Uh, anytime. It's strange for me to play music in front of a room where there are children. It doesn't happen super often that like there is a child at an experimental ambient music happening 
when it does happen, it's always the person I want to talk to the most about what their experience was like with the music because they have such a different context for what they just saw was because they have no context for it. And so I have had kids after a show and like a daytime festival, outdoor thing, come up to me and be like, it sounded like wandering through a forest. And it was like the most fulfilling, pure response to music that I've made that I've ever experienced. Uh, because there's no bullshit in it. It's just like they listened to the air that I made wiggle and that made things happen in their body. And then they're not afraid to also say uh, something that's so oblique or also something so obvious. Uh, whereas I think some people, especially in the experimental music community, really want to talk about some like highbrow angle about what you did or like, I love the timbre, like, shut up. Like, okay, cool. <laughs> but like, really what I want, I want you to go on a little adventure. That's why I make the music that I make. It's nonverbal communication. So like, mm -hmm. I want to tell you a story where you have agency. I have a kid tell me it was like, it was like wandering through the woods and then there was a bear and it got really scary at that one part, but then it got pretty at the end and it reminded me of icicles. And I was like, <laughs> I'm good. I've done it. I don't need to make any more music. <laughs> that's the best. That's the best thing I've heard about my work ever. Is that kind of stuff that? I, and I, it's only kids. It only happens mm -hmm. with kids. And you pat them on the head, and then they away they go. I make a face at them, and they tell their parents that <laughs> yeah. I am scary. <laughs> no, but really, that's the stuff that uh, makes me believe in the kind of music that I make. Mm -hmm. Is that. Uh, it can be a thing with a deep legacy of concept and Brian Eno's ambient principles and deep listening and all this stuff, but you can play it to an eight year old and they can find value in wordless floaty music. That's exciting. To That's me. the shit right there. That's yeah. the shit. I double down on that. Yeah. Yeah. Hell yeah. Oof. Yeah. I'm just like, <laughs> I'm goose open just thinking about when, and it's happened a few times in my life and every time, like I saw a kid once I was playing a show at the comfort station in Chicago, oh, which is a really beautiful little community space, space in Logan cool. square. And I worked with this fantastic woman at a writing center at one of the Chicago city colleges. And she brought her son who was like eight or nine. And he had been on his Nintendo switch all night, which like, hell yeah, I have a switch. I love my switch. <laughs> and then he put it away during my set and he was sitting right in the front with her and she had never been to an experimental music concert. So he certainly had never encountered music like this. He's a really shy little guy, but he put his switch away and watched me play. And then after the show, he was like, uh, it sounded like a video. And I was like, for him to decide in his own agency to put his switch away and to like watch me like twirl knobs on a keyboard and like play with an out of tune piano and have him respond in a way that he was like, this was interesting to me. I would, and then afterwards my coworker, uh, she texted me and she was like, he was so into that. And I was like, I know <laughs> <laughs> those are the moments that are most exciting to me. Wow. Yeah. I, I there's gotta be some non weird way to collaborate with child children as musicians like yeah. that. And there's a free idea to someone <laughs> that that's a that's a fertile ground and that's yeah have you seen this viral thing where a married couple who are like experimental artists uh the woman in the relationship became pregnant and her uh, male partner wrote some MIDI code from what i understand she maybe also wrote part of the code too and they like hooked up uh some sort of like sensors to her pregnant <laughs> belly and translated the moving inside of her and belly into MIDI keyboard notes that then they like turned into music that then uh, was getting covered on Pitchfork. And it was one of those things where as someone who makes memes about experimental music, I was like, there's, I can't add anything to this. <laughs> there's nothing for me it's, to do. It's done. Like that is a complete piece yeah. where yeah. it's a punchline and uh, an artwork at the same time. I can't yeah. touch that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the only thing that comes to mind is maybe that's what the machines were after in the Matrix, was just some tasty <laughs> tunes. What we wanted was some tunes. What we so wanted was some fucking tunes. tunes. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> I mean, it's hard for it's hard for machines to make music, you know. It's true. Music like oh my humans. God. <laughs> All right. <laughs> 
Well, as we <laughs> exit the womb yeah. and, and enter back in, we find ourselves staring at the light at the end of the tunnel and, and not really knowing what's on the other side of it, but knowing that this journey was powerful and, and good, and we did things today together. We did it. Yeah, it was great. Thanks for having me. It was really fun. <laughs> of course. And of uh, course, the invitation is always open, and I'm sure uh, thank you. I'm sure we'll we'll be seeing lots of each other in the future. Yeah. But also, happy birthday, Jake! Yeah, oh. happy birthday, Jake! Yeah, I've had, a, I've had a very blessed day, and like this last week's been really wonderful, and uh, I'm just feeling extremely thankful and full of gratitude. So, thank you guys for Aww. being here on my birthday. Yeah. Uh, this is this is this is the brunch crew I would want to hang out with too, it's and a, a million other people too. But this this one in particular is is quite nice. So thank you. Thanks, guys. y'all. Um, as as we get to the end here, we like to go around and just uh, you know provide final thoughts and words. Matt, I think that you probably have some stuff coming up that people want to know about, or you want to tell people about. Yeah. Uh, Copy links. I have a lot of these. there. Cool. I have a lot of music coming out this year. Uh, and it's a lot of it is because it got bottlenecked because of COVID. So it seems like it's all coming out at once and I'm making it all in real time, but that's not the case. It's like music that I've been largely working on over the last two or so years. And it's all sort of coming out at once. Um, but I had that a free an album under the moniker Free Dust that came out on Past Inside the Present Records in January. And that is out in the world on vinyl and uh, on streaming services. I've also been playing with a uh, long distance ambient jazz quartet uh, with myself, Chris Giselle, Chaz Premek, and Patrick Shira Ishii. And I love those guys dearly. We had our second CD in a series come out uh, about a month ago, the first week of February, uh, called Setsubun. And then the one before that's called Fubatsushi. Both of those CDs sold out, but you can stream both of them online. Uh, we have a spring edition coming out. Uh, it's called Yamawaru. This is an exclusive for you. Uh, ooh, ooh. And it is coming out in probably like mid April. That's probably going to come out in April. And then uh, you can expect more full length projects from me later this year. Uh, and I'm really excited about both of them. Yep. That's awesome. Uh, tons sharing. of stuff happening with some tons of stuff happening with cached too. So stay tuned. I was going to gonna ask. I was like, do you want to drop the cash stuff too? <laughs> yeah. So there's like a ton of stuff happening with cached. Um, there's still going to be some CDs trickling, out, which is a social distance project that's happening where uh, Colin Blanton, who makes music as Bryn, uh, Mari, who makes music as More Ease, and Jimmy Tamborello from Dentel and the Postal Service are doing uh, file exchange music uh i'm so freaked out because the whole idea was like we're going to do social di distance series and then to have the progenitor of the postal service uh the first yeah. you know band that they were sending files across long distances to make music as a part of it feels very um uh, yeah huge <laughs> and so, yeah. Uh, so so that's due out in a couple of months and i've heard a few snippets and it's just like so weird and great i'm so excited for everyone to hear that uh, we have six books out this year, and that's sort of like what's going to be happening outside of the CDs is we have these like intermedia uh, print book projects that are coming, um, and they're going to be pretty diverse and pretty weird, and I'm really excited about them. So yeah, that's what's happening with Cached. Teaching a bunch. Oh yeah, also, I'm having a kid this year. <laughs> So 2021, is, 2021 <laughs> is absolutely overwhelming and very exciting. Yeah. yeah. The, in some ways, the penultimate. <laughs> it's like, yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> it's a very, yeah, it's very wild. Now I can't think about descriptors at all because I can't yeah. say wild or crazy. What about yeah. wild and crazy kids? <laughs> well, I know that's ruined too. <laughs> Canceled. <Done. laughs> um. Well, I'm just going to jump in and say, hey, look out for that stuff. Uh, yeah. Check out Matt's work, all the cash stuff. Check out Matt's kid at some time, at some point. Uh, that'll be <laughs> he's going to be a kid. He's going to be a kid, not on the internet, I think. Okay, cool. Cool, cool, yeah. cool. Yep. Uh, so don't look forward to that. And um, I'm just going to throw my, it to Rick now. It's my Thank secret. You. <laughs> yeah. 
BD uh, love, very appreciate it. Smooches to the world. Yeah. Um, travel agency, we don't have much stuff coming up in front of the scenes. We're taking next week off, and we'll be back in two weeks with another art brunch. Um, following that soon, uh, Two Black Artists in Conversation show will be launching um, with uh, with Tiffany Sutton. We look forward to that. And Stars Align comes, you know, was this week. So we've got a month between then and the future. Um, mm-hmm. And there might be some fun, like, one-off stuff that, that we're doing. So, Giandre, thanks for the follow. Best way to keep up with what we're doing is following. Most of our stuff is scheduled, but occasionally I, you know, uh, I get I get a little get a little tickle and i have to go live for for my own reasons um but yes uh lots of love to matt sage and to you jake happy birthday and um peace out happy birthday jake thanks trick thanks everybody in chat thanks travel agency thanks pepperidge farms yes uh this is the this is the end here um thanks for all the follows today thanks for all the great chat messages uh you can follow our links here if you want to connect with the travel agency further and we will see you in a couple of weeks uh enjoy your time